ministry, we want to spend a little bit of time with y'all, walking you through a process that we've been working on to better be part of what we do in 2012. We started looking at potentially revising our enforcement and Um, in terms of the way we want to sort of run through this, <laughs> uh, the way we're going to be working through this today um, is very conversational. So really encourage people to ask questions. And, you know, have it. We, we're here to have a dialogue. And really want you to be able to get your your voice heard. So just wanted to make that clear with everyone. We're uh, planning to be here. We're available till 1 o'clock. That does go through the lunch hour, so recognize that may be hard for folks, but just also let you know that, that we'll be here and we can move into that time frame um, if the conversations are still rolling. So what I'd like to do is just go around the room and ask folks to introduce themselves, and if you want to say a little bit about uh, who you work for or what your interests are, we'd love to hear that. And then uh, we'll start here with ourselves. So, I think this is good. No? You hold it closer to your mouth. I don't know that this projects, does it? Yeah. Okay. So, my name is Liz Dent, and I serve as the State Forest Division Chief with the Oregon Department of Forestry. So, I oversee um, all the activities and the policy work. I work with the Board of Forestry, stakeholders, um, county commissioners on kind of everything that has to do with managing these state forests. And I'm Justin Buttress, uh, policy analyst for the State Forest uh, Program, also the project manager for the Forest Management Plan. Hi, I'm Nick Palazzato. I'm the lead wildlife bio for uh, State Forest Division, and uh, I'm involved in both the Forest Management Plan and Habitat Conservation Plan projects. Hi, I'm Ty Williams. I'm the District Operations Coordinator here on the Astoria District and also uh, part of the uh, FMP um, plan team. Hi, I'm Mike Wilson. I'm the Resource Support Unit Manager for the State Forest Division, and I manage our policy staff biologist, Nick, and an aquatic riparian specialist, engineer, and, and those sorts of folks who have specialist roles uh, in the FMP. So a lot of my folks are on the FMP team, including myself. <clears throat> I'm Kathleen Sullivan, I'm a uh, county commissioner for District 4. Megan Inley with the Oregon Department of Forestry. I'm, I'm also the uh, forest, uh, uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm also the representative of the FDLIC for Clansett County. I'm Paula Bew and part of the Citizen Advisory Committee for Lewis and Clark area. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ron Zilli. I'm the Deputy Division Chief for State Forests uh, out of Salem. Worked with uh, Liz and the team here. Uh, I was also responsible for the planning coordination team in Salem. Good morning. I'm Jenny Johnson, citizen here in Clatsop County, and previously worked in um, as a forester in the area. Um, just here today to learn more about this new plan and here to um, I guess support keeping working for us working. Pamela Madsen McDonald, granddaughter of lumber professionals. I'm here because I'm concerned about the forests. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Neil Bond. I'm the Protection Unit Forester for the Oregon Department of Forestry here in Astoria. And what that means is I'm in charge of the uh, private forest program and the protection program here. I'm Tom Scoggins. I'm a retired forester and member of the State Forest Advisory Committee. Good morning. I'm Ashley LaTorre. I'm a stewardship forester for the Oregon Department of Forestry here in Astoria. Just for whatever, I live in Astoria. I wear multiple hats. I'm a director at large for Clatsop Soil Water Conservation District. I sit on the board of the North Coast Watershed Association and I'm a county planning commissioner. My main concerns are water in forests and keeping the water clean and plentiful. Thank you. 
I'm Roger Gorban. <clears throat> I've been a resident of Astoria for about 10 years. I, uh, by profession, I'm an artist and photographer. I do a lot of landscape photography, so quite naturally I'm concerned about the forest. Uh, and I also have been doing a lot of writing in the last five years, uh, researching forest issues and writing for one of our local papers. I'm Jed Arnold. I work for um, Hampton Family Forests, which is the land management division of Hampton Lumber. I'm Ted Messing, uh, Brownsville, 45 year resident, and we are pretty much surrounded by state forests, so we are always concerned what's going on. <laughs> Cheryl Johnson, Brownsmeet, and I'm on the Northeast um, Citizen Advisory for rewriting the uh, Clatsop County Comprehensive Land Use Plan. My name is Todd Lundy. Good morning. I, I'm on the committee for revising the Clatsop County uh, Comprehensive Plan. Hi, my name is Donald Wargo. I'm with the Chinook Indian Nation and part of the Natural Resources Committee. And, uh, college student at Grace Harbor College for Forestry. I'm Sally Spiller. I live in Napa, and I'm also part of the Northeast Comprehensive Plan Citizen Advisory Committee. Um, my main interest is that the um, new forest management plan has real strict uh, conservation goals that um, are actionable and, and not vague at all and because I'm concerned about how our management plan affects the overall health of the forest and you know wildlife other you know protected species that kind of thing thank you good morning I'm Don Boone I'm the county manager Gail Hendrickson, Clatsop County Community Development Director. Monica Steele, Assistant County Manager. I'm Mike Baldwin, I was born and raised in Clatsop County my entire life, worked in the timber industry about 34 years, the last 33 and a half of that for J.M. Browning Logging out of Astoria. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. So does this, okay, so the speaker works. I don't have to use the handheld one. Great, thanks for those introductions. It really, that is loud, is it not? Let me turn it down a little bit. That's just right. It's just right, okay. All right, so it's helpful to uh, hear what you all um, are interested in and the type, to me it helps us understand the types of conversations we need to be sure and touch on today. So, um, we're holding this meeting today to um, discuss the forest management plan and the main purpose of today is really to introduce you to the document itself, uh, recognizing um, all of, as we walk through that, there are going to be comments and uh, questions and concerns and we're here to really capture all of that. Uh, one of the reasons our, our approach here is, is uh, with you all is two-stepped. One is, this is the first step of introducing you to the document. Um, recognize you may not have had enough time to kind of dig into it yet. Um, gather all of your feedback. And then we're going to have another meeting on <clears throat> January 14th. And that meeting is going to be in Salem. And at that meeting, uh, ideally, you will have had enough time to kind of dig into the plan. And we can have another conversation um, on what your concerns, questions, or input might be. So uh, we have been holding these meetings in other locations around the state and with different um, sort of governmental or advisory committee bodies. So the State Forest Advisory Committee, which was mentioned today, the Forest Trust Lands Advisory Committee. Um, we've had a public meeting in Salem. There's an online survey. We'll touch on all this at the end of the presentation, but wanting to give you a flavor, uh, as well as an opportunity to send emails to ODF. So this has been, this is really the outreach process that we're going through. We're going to collect every, all the input and collate that from all this different input that we're getting. And, and ultimately, in April, we'll be going to the Board of Forestry, and we will 
have taken the input that we have received, and some of it we will have been able to incorporate into that document that we're bringing to the Board of Forestry. Some of the input that we're already getting is pretty complex in nature and, and will require more time to incorporate. So we'll characterize that for the Board of Forestry as well, saying here's what we heard and here's some ways we could handle it. It would take, we just need more time to do that. And then there'll be some input that we're not able to incorporate. And in that case, we'll be able to explain why. So trying to just really have a very transparent process and make sure that your voices are heard and that we can bring that to the table with the Board of Forestry. So that's really the, really the intent here, is just really to kick that off with everybody and hopefully give you enough information to start digging in. Um, at the April Board of Forestry meeting, uh, our intent at that point is to uh, show the board the work that's been done, to present them what is a, is a re, an updated, if you will, revised draft forest management plan and really ask them to set that on the side burner for a while um, while we work on some other um, effort. The a big one being um, our uh, process in trying to attain what's called a habitat conservation plan. So what a habitat conservation plan does, it's another policy approach to managing state forests and, and it's an agreement with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marines Fisheries Service. And with the Habitat Conservation Plan, we have this agreement with those federal agencies on, uh, that is, is uh, a long-term agreement, 50 to 75 years, depending on where we land. And in that agreement, we establish with the services the types of conservation that's needed uh, to contribute to the recovery of these species and to protect their uh, habitat for these threatened and endangered species. Uh, there's several species that we're pursuing to have coverage, if you will, under the HCP, including some of the well-known ones like northern spotted owls, marble murelets, coho, steelhead, et cetera, some salamanders. Um, so we've been working on those together. We've been both working on this draft forest management plan, and we've been working on the HCP for several years. So we've gotten the forest management plan to a point uh, where we can say, hey, here, here's the work that's been done. Let's set that aside for a moment, so to speak, while we continue our work on the Habitat Conservation Plan. And we'll be bringing that work to the Board of Forestry in October. So in October, we'll be able to have a discussion with the Board along the lines of, do we continue working on the HCP and move into a more um, intensive process with the federal services known as NEPA? Or should we just continue working on a forest management plan without an expectation to get a habitat conservation plan? So there's pros and cons uh, to both. Um, but, and we want to get to a place this next year in 2020 where we're not pursuing both of these efforts. So um, I can talk more about uh, the pros and cons of each of those maybe after we get going here a little bit. So that's the process that we're engaged in. Um, the intent today, again, is to introduce you to the document and also give you a little grounding and background on the um, purpose and goals for managing these lands. So uh, we're going to tag team the effort and we'll each go through uh, a, a couple little sections in our presentation and then we'll pause for questions and discussion before we keep moving on. So that sounds good to everybody. I'll turn it over to Justin. Uh, it's actually still you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I won't turn it over to Justin. Do you have the clicker? I do. Okay. Oh, it already moved. So um, as we um, began this work uh, in 2012, we, had re we were at a place in time coming out of the Great Recession where um, we were extremely challenged to continue implementing our current forest management plan. So we started working with the board to determine if there were some revisions that could be made. Um, to uh, allow us to fully implement a forest management plan and be able to support ourselves financially to do that. 
And the board also asked us to increase conservation outcomes. So that's the intent of the plan revision. I also want to uh, make clear to folks that we're really operating under a plan, while it's been revised a couple of times, but a plan, the basic um, foundation of the plan was established in uh, 2001. So we're, we're coming up on 20 years since that first plan was adopted. And so not only is this a good opportunity uh, to look at increasing conservation and financial outcomes, we've also learned a lot in 20 years. We've learned it from implementing the work on the ground, and there's also a lot of new uh, data and information. Current plan, for example, doesn't, uh, to, doesn't really address climate change with any kind of depth. And so that's one example of one of the changes that we're proposing. Another big change um, is that we current, sorry. The current uh, approach to managing these forests um, is utilizing multiple plans. So in this map, you can see the, the uh, Board of Forestry ownership in blue and we own uh, forests from here in Clatsop County all the way down uh, near the California border and in Klamath County on the east side of the Cascades. We're managing, what we're proposing is that we create one forest management plan that, uh, that um, addresses our forest management on all of our lands west of the Cascades. And this creates a lot of efficiency because currently we're using three forest management plans for this area. We've got our Northwest Forest Management Plan, we've got a Southwest Oregon Forest Management Plan, and then we have some properties that we manage out in Coos County, uh, actually under what's called the Elliott Forest Management Plan. So our proposal here allows us to, to sort of collapse that into one forest management plan, which makes it a lot more efficient for us to uh, address these sort of high-level policies. The, uh, what we're not talking about today are lands that we manage on the east side of the Cascades in Klamath County, which include our Sun, <coughs> our Sun Pass uh, Forest and our Gilchrist State Forest, and those are being managed under an Eastern Oregon Long Range Plan. So should this come to fruition, we would have two plans, one for the west side and one for the east side. There's a lot of diversity uh, ecologically, <coughs> excuse me, um, in this, what would be covered under one plan. And so what we've um, done in our design of this revision is to keep it at the right level so that we can um, implement the plan in a way that is congruent, if you will, with ecological conditions uh, on the west side of the Cascades. So it'd be more, um, more efficient, but also would require the flexibility to implement it across the geography. Let's see, which button is it, do you know? Oh, there it goes, okay. So um, the <clears throat> basis of the plan, there's some key elements and foundational to it to the plan is what's called ecological forestry. This is not really different than our current forest management plan. Our current forest management plan really has the same philosophy and integrated ecological forestry approach. But again, in 20 years, a lot's been learned about ecological forestry, and so we've incorporated that into the basis of the plan. Another big difference is thinking about managing the forest for a range of serial stages, and that, in shorthand, that means a range of age classes. Um, which is different than the current plan, which um, has us thinking about the forest in kind of five different structure types and managing towards those structure types. So it's a more, um, it's kind of a more distributed way of thinking about um, managing the forest and the types of habitat that's provided in those different age classes. It's a better treatment of climate change. I mentioned that already. We have um, a disease called Swiss needle cast on our forest, and it's particularly um, severe and extensive on our Tillamook State Forest. The current forest management plan isn't, doesn't necessarily um, provide the best tool for addressing Swiss needle cast, and so these adjustments we think are gonna help us do that. And then the Board of Forestry asked us as we develop this plan to include what's called measurable outcomes. So the current plan doesn't have that. We think that's a benefit because it, it, it states really what are we trying to achieve and that way we can make sure we're measuring the right elements to know if we're achieving the goals of the plan. And then we're introducing a different approach to adaptive management and that's called structured decision making. Um, and we'll walk through that a little bit today as well. 
So now I will hand it over to Justin to talk about our legal mandates. Yeah. Is it the red button? It's no. All right, uh, so I just want to uh, briefly cover uh, the, the two basic um, laws that uh, really drive forest management planning for us. Uh, so starting with our legal mandates, like I mentioned, we have two primary laws that direct us on how to manage uh, Oregon State Forests. Uh, the first is called the Greatest Permanent Value Rule, and the second is the Forest Management Planning Rule. Um, I have provided uh, copies of the, the complete rules uh, over on the, the table as a handout. Uh, it's uh, about seven pages or so of uh, stapled together. Um, I'm just going to briefly kind of run through uh, some of the highlights, but should you have any questions, uh, want to get into a little more depth, I'm happy to do that for you. Uh, so state forest lands are required to be managed for the greatest per permanent value to the state. That's established in statute. Um, and then we further defined the term greatest permanent value in administrative rule uh, to mean healthy, productive, and sustainable forest ecosystems that over time and across the landscape provide a full range of social, economic, and environmental benefits to the people of Oregon. GPV requires the state forester to maintain the lands as forest lands and to actively manage them in a sound environmental manner to provide sustainable timbers to harvest and revenues. So that um, basically means that uh, state forest lands are working forests and uh, uh, we have to make sure that we're, we're doing sound environmental management uh, as we're going through that. Uh, GPV also requires some key outcomes. Uh, management must result in a high probability of maintaining and restoring properly functioning aquatic habitats. We must also protect, maintain, and enhance wildlife habitats. We must protect soil, air, and water, and we must provide outdoor recreation opportunities. That's all established in the Greatest Permanent Value Rule. So moving from the conceptual framework that the Greatest Permanent Value Rule provides, uh, we can move into the more prescriptive requirements that are established by the planning rule. The planning rule establishes six general categories of information to be included in the plan. Uh, again, there's a handout that's been provided that has the planning terms on it, um, and I'll just run through those briefly, but you have that for your reference. Um, so guiding principles are principles that guide development of the plan, including both legal requirements and Board of Forestry policies. The resource description provides information on the current condition of the forest resources. Resource goals are statements of what the forester intends to achieve for each forest resource. Uh, the fourth element is strategies, which describe how the resources will be managed to achieve the goals. Uh, I'm not going to cover all of the specific requirements for strategies that are found in the rule, uh, but there are some specific uh, elements uh, that are, are some specific strategies that have, must be contained within the FMP. So examples of those requirements are uh, strategies must provide for active management. Uh, they must contribute to uh, biological diversity of forest stand types and structures must manage forest conditions to result in a high probability of maintaining and restoring properly functioning aquatic habitats, and must protect, maintain, and enhance native wildlife habitats. So pretty similar uh, to the GPV rule, the strategies that must be contained within the plan must be consistent with greatest permanent value, essentially. Uh, and finally, the guidelines uh, within the plan establish the general framework for managing the forest as an asset for implementing the forest management plan, and for implementing monitoring and adaptive management plans. In addition to those requirements uh, for this plan that we've uh, proposed, we've also added measurable outcomes, which are the quantifiable results of strategies. Uh, we're going to spend more time discussing that particular aspect uh, as we go along here this morning, uh, because we feel that those measurable outcomes are, are especially important for stakeholders. Once we've developed a draft forest management plan, the planning rule requires the board to review and direct any necessary revisions to ensure that that forest management plan meets greatest permanent value. Then the forest management plan is adopted as an Oregon administrative rule, and then the state forester will implement the forest management plan through other plans with smaller temporal and spatial scales. So just a thumbnail sketch of sort of the legal framework that we have uh, at, at play here with the forest management plan. Uh, before I turn it over to Nick, are there any questions on any of those laws that I just covered? 
Great. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'm a notorious uh, quiet talker, so let me know if I need to speak up. Okay, so the overarching approach of the plan is or remains an ecological approach to forest management. Uh, the current plan, as Liz mentioned, incorporates some of the principles and concepts of ecological forestry, specifically in its approach to landscape management for a diverse array of stand types, in functional configurations, uh, and in the silvicultural prescriptions themselves that are designed to promote complex or oldest forest structure. And so the ecological approach described in this revised plan is an update and an evolution of these previous ecosystem-based approaches like the current plan. Uh, and it's based on, as Liz mentioned, 20 years of, or, or more of new science and improved understanding of the ecological, social, and, and political systems uh, that guide forest management in the region. Uh, so the overall goal of an ecological approach to forest management is to sustain and support the integrity, the ecological integrity and productivity of the forest, thereby improving resilience, uh, so that you know the ability to withstand and recover from disturbance, and also the capacity to adapt to change over time. This approach views the resources and benefits that we derive from state forests within the context both of societal values, so uh, the many social values and benefits we get from the forest, as well as economic values, uh, such as support for rural communities and natural resource-related economies, uh, and also within the context of the forest ecosystem. And so both these you know, sort of social values and the ecosystem itself are, are dynamic through time and hard to predict. Uh, and the notion is that people and benefits are part of the system uh, and providing for sustainable systems, providing for sustainable systems provides the social license for management and allows for benefits to flow. So a healthy forest, benefits flow. Uh, and thus, in this context, the entire forest is a working forest, providing many services across the landscape and through time, uh, including wildlife and wildland conservation, timber production, aquatic habitat restoration, carbon sequestration, uh, robust recreational opportunities, and non-timber forest products. And an ecological approach acknowledges and anticipates change uh, and uncertainty in forest development and in disturbances, in societal values and its demands, and in future climate scenarios and effects on forest productivity and biodiversity. Uh, so in the simplest sense, the, the idea here is the, like the primary bet hedging strategy is to provide options on the landscape through time, but not put all your eggs in one specific basket, forest type basket, so to speak. Uh, and that enhances the, the flexibility and adaptability in response to change. And so obviously critical to all of this then is a formal adaptive management program, which is a central tenant of the revised plan and is used to address all of the uncertainty that we're acknowledging and the risks associated with uh, setting long-term targets and long-term planning. So that's kind of a lot. If you guys have questions, I'll definitely uh, entertain them. Excuse me, um, Justin's going to bring a mic around so that this is on streaming so that the folks can hear what's going on. All right. Anyway, I'm curious on this. When you clear cut and then you come back and plant, do you have a stand that is all the same age? And my understanding is this is why we ended up with Swiss needle cast, because you used to plant all of Douglas fir really close together, 10 feet apart, and so on. And so why, can you explain to me what the ecological value of clear cuts are? And, and then I have a little, one more. What do you tell me now? Well, I'm going to have something I want to add, but go ahead. No, no, no is that? Okay, so part one, the ecological value of clear cuts. Uh, well, so science over the last 20 years has, there has been a lot of science and research pointing to uh, young stands as sort of uh, 
the, the seminal paper called it the forgotten stage of forest succession. Uh, so there has been, you know, there was a lot of focus leading up to the Federal Northwest Forest Plan on old forests and old forest species. Uh, and, and somewhere along the way, there wasn't a lot of pen attention paid to the value of habitat provided by young stands. In the last 20 years of research, they've discovered, yeah, there are a bunch of species that are associated with young stands as well. Um, and young stands provide a number of other services. They actually, it gets really nuanced, but they actually sequester carbon at a faster rate than larger trees, for example. Um, so I'm a wildlife biologist and I can talk to species and habitat, but there might be other folks here more suited to speak to other aspects of the forest. I'll just talk well, a little bit about the wildlife. I would just add that um, not all the trees that we plant are, the, I mean, not, not all the trees in a new stand are the same age because on average we're leaving five to seven tr green trees on the landscape when we're conducting uh, clear cut harvest. And then we're also reserving a lot of the uh, smaller eight inch and under species that have no uh, economic value, but provide um, to the complexity of the future stand. So. Okay, I don't, I don't, we don't need to get into an argument, but I would, I'm surrounded by the state forest, and I've seen some of those clear cuts and these trees and leaves. I, I'm sorry, it, it just looks kind of like a joke to me, but. Uh, it seems like when we first moved to Brown Street, we had the forest that was there. It was after the first wave of loggers went through. So whatever grew back, there was no planting. It grew back from self-seeding uh, and so on. We had this diverse forest, multi-species, multi-age, an incredibly healthy forest. Man, you could hike through there. Uh, we had elk, elk herds and everything. Then you came in and clear-cut everything and planted Doug fir. And now I understand you're realizing you can't just plant just Douglas fir because you've got Swiss needle cats that's killing you now. So uh, I, I, anyway, I'm, I guess I'm skeptical of what I see, and what, what you tell me and what I see. I mean, sometimes there'll be like one tree over here, one tree over there, and then they blow down. Is there some reason you can't selective cut in Oregon? Well, I, th I think there's several great examples of uh, selective cutting uh, in the Brownsmead area that we've done over the last 20 years. Um, we've taken stands in the 35 to 40 year old age class and thinned to get them to, uh, you know, to grow uh, on their most productive rate um, off Davis Bottom Road, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, there are several stands in there that are really good examples of that that are already even though they're fairly young, 55 years old, um, we actually, as a team, went out and looked at th this specific stand on our tour last year, and um, uh, Nick was there with us, and uh, you know, everybody was surprised at the age of that stand, how complex that was that we did select, because it had been selective, um, uh, Lee thinned. So uh, there is no law against it, it's just, you know, like we said, like Nick was indicating, uh, not doing the same thing everywhere, not thinning everything and not clear cutting everything. We do a mix on the landscape and it's uh, let, uh, let the stand or the goals of the stand dictate um, what harvest prescription best fits for that, uh, for that stand. So um, those are just some of the different tools we, we have in our toolbox. Okay, then my next question is when, when they do, when the clear cuts I've seen now, not all of them are state forest, they're some private. Correct. And uh, the debris afterwards, uh, the slash, if you will, they pile it up. Sometimes you burn it, sometimes you don't. How can you don't leave that uh, slash evenly distributed over the clear cut? For me, I, I grew up as a farmer, and that way you're basically fertilizing the land with the slash as it was. So if you pile it up, you get it in one spot. Is there a reason you pile it? Well, we pile it mostly to burn it and to create planting spots because especially, uh, you know, on, on the west side of the foothills, we have, you know, where we have a, a heavy mix of, of, of spruce and hemlock along with Doug fir, there's uh, 
an abundance of slash that would make planting hard to do. So we're not we're not going through and picking up every limb and, and stick from the, you know, there's still a lot that's left out there, uh, debris, but we try to get the bigger concentrations to create planting spots. And then we do try to uh, burn all the piles that we plant. It's all based on days when we have are able to burn and stuff through smoke management. Yeah, and I mean, just to, just to sort of round out, I would, to sort of back up and talk about our basic strategies, we are planting minor species. We're not, we don't do plantation forestry out across our entire landscape. Uh, so we're planting cedar, we're planting sitka, hemlock, alder. When we do leave trees, they tend to leave uh, where we spray, they leave spray shadows of shrubby vegetation. And so uh, we're not, we don't have the cleanest clear cuts in the world. And we have snag and downed wood requirements, both of which exceed Forest Practices Act, as well as our green trees. And so we like to think we're leaving a lot out there. Uh, yeah, and I just to sort of round that out to be clear. Um, my question was, what is the benchmark or what are the benchmarks for forest productivity? Like how, how much, where, uh, who, and who sets those productivity standards? It does. <clears throat> it's a compelling and good question. And <clears throat> if I I think the best way for us to answer that is about sustainable harvest levels over time. And so that's how we think about productivity. We have, we, we inventory our stands to determine sort of uh, how much volume is out there. And then we calculate how much we think we can harvest so that over time we're not over harvesting. So that's sort of how we think about productivity is one thing. And the other thing is, in terms of, a, so that's a landscape look, and then like a stand-by-stand stand basis, um, it's a little bit more around the civil cultural practices that are best suited for that area. So some of our areas are really what we call good growing ground, and you all are blessed with that here. It's really productive for us here, um, as compared to in our Tillamook district, where there's been, you know, historically several fires. It was reforested with what we call off-site seed of Douglas fir, which made it more susceptible to Swiss needle cast. So those areas are actually almost non-productive. Those trees are barely growing at this point. And that's both a combination of the species off-site seed that was used so it wasn't well suited for that area I, I think we need to have a little uh, grace for that time period when that was done, though. It was an, uh, an unprecedented amount of reforestation that had to happen after those huge Tillamook burns that happened year after year. Also did was hard on the soils, that steep ground and thin soils. So that's the juxtaposition, if you will, and they're, they're really, these two land bases aren't far apart. Tillamook, um, very poor growing ground, not very productive. Different story here, that dictates really the volume that we can harvest, the and the response that we think is going to happen through thinning, et cetera, you're going to get a much different response here thinning than you would in Tillamook. Does that answer your question, Paula? Okay. Yeah, I had a question about about the uh, grove of trees you described out near Browns Mead that was being thinned. Uh, my understanding is that usually those kind of uh, thinnings are referred to as pre-commercial thinnings. In other words, the fate of the trees uh, after it's been thinned is uh, possibly to be clear cut. And I was just wondering, can you guarantee that those, those uh, areas that you're thinning and improving will be conservation areas after they've grown up into healthy, larger trees? Uh, no, we can't because a lot of our stands, um, we, we go in, a pre-commercial thinning is when the stand is usually between 15 and 21, 22. And that pre-commercial means there's no commercial um, value to what we're doing. We're going in there and um, spacing out the trees by slashing the smaller trees. Uh, what I was talking about was a, our first entry commercial thin, 
that we conducted when the when the stand was around 35 years old um, and we go in there and selectively harvest leaving the biggest and best trees taking out the the co-dominant or the suppressed trees or intermediate trees out of the stand to release the co the other co-dominant and dominant trees and then uh, we may go in and have a second commercial thinning in the life of that stand or we might wait 25 years and then go um, uh, uh, conduct a clear cut uh, harvest on that stand. So it's all based on our kind of our landscape design and, and the goals of the stand, um, you know, f how they fit in on the landscape. So um, maybe oh. I guess I, uh, I, I had my thinking really kind of changed this summer uh, in regard to forest management <clears throat> and that I discovered a grove of trees. Uh, I'm not going to reveal where it is because it's kind of sacred to me. <clears throat> Uh, it's a grove that was logged 160 years ago when they were still using oxen and so forth and it hasn't been touched since then and it is absolutely a gorgeous you'd have to say old growth forest with a beautiful understory uh, it's just magnificent and uh, that's without any kind of management whatsoever and we seem you know as a people we're so determined to manage every square inch of our forest I'm not sure that's the best plan and I have a real kind of conflict with the idea that ecological integrity and forest productivity are two things that go hand in hand because I feel like the whole plan is uh, heavily uh, heavily uh, swayed in the direction of timber harvest and here we are you know within the last six years when this plan was begun uh, we've got a lot of new science we now know that we're in an absolute climate crisis and uh, we can't actually say with a straight face anymore that the greatest possible good for our forests is to, you know, share between harvest and all the and the other values. Uh, maybe leaving them alone for some time would actually be more of a benefit. Anyway, that's that's my personal philosophy, and I realize that it's something that you guys have to work with and balance. But when I read through the plan, I did, I read most of it. You know, I, I, I saw that climate change was sprinkled in there, but it does not receive what I consider uh, the proper amount of weight. It should be on every single page, on every single thing that's done, climate change and the crisis situation that we're in needs to be addressed and how the various aspects of the plan address that problem. So that's all I'll say for now. And just to respond, really, really appreciate that perspective and also just, I'm sure you know you're not alone on that. And um, the current plan really does contemplate and promote the notion of managing across the entire landscape and that over time, as older forests develop in one place on the landscape, something that is... Uh, has been in an older forest condition prior to that would be available for harvest. And so in that way, what the plan envisions is what's called the current plan, not this draft, um, is what is referenced as a shifting mosaic. So the notion that you're going to have these conditions that change over time and across the landscape. What we have found is that that's very difficult to implement. And there's a number of reasons for it. One is we have a fairly small spatial scale as compared to like a federal land ownership. So uh, we're managing on the west side around 650,000 acres, if I'm remembering that number correctly. Um, so that makes that, that sort of um, approach really challenging to implement. Um, the other thing is that what we're living with is that as more and more species are being listed as threatened and endangered, um, and then policies are being established on how we protect those species. Those areas, I would say, get locked in on the landscape. We're never, you know, many of those areas, we're not going to have an opportunity. There won't be a, a plan to harvest those in the future. So murrelet management areas is a perfect example. Once those are established to protect murrelets, they're never going to be harvested. And then there's a buffer around them that can have some thinning but it has to be very, it's very narrow and sort of purpose of that thinning. We have circles to protect northern spotted owls. We can harvest in there depending on the forest conditions, but there are portions of it that will never be harvested. Riparian areas are increasingly not being harvested. So there are areas on the landscape which are starting to lock in 
And so that philosophy of things shifting around the landscape is kind of breaking down. Well, in light of that, you might say Bible. Uh, Sorry, the, uh, there's a. In light, of, in light of what you just said, do you think it's a viable uh, plan to, for counties to continue to be reliant on logging you know, public land for, to provide for services? And also, you know, I understand that about a third of your budget comes from logging public land. You've got this limited amount of forest. You're saying that a lot of it's going to be taken off the table, probably. Uh, how much longer can we go along with this type yeah. of plan? And shouldn't there be a really aggressive effort right now, a lobbying effort to change the financial structure so that <clears throat> uh, a lot of the money that that uh, is coming to the counties from cutting down basically our trees should be coming from taxation of the uh, industrial timber companies. Uh, and that could also, in part, uh, take care of the budget for the forestry department. Yeah. It just seems like we're kicking the can down the road, but it's not very far into the future before costs in the counties are going to exceed what the forest can provide. And there you are, you know, you're stuck in a very tough position. If you don't start laying the plan down now, we're going to be in bad shape. So um, I heard you say that this plan kind of started with the recession or in, in the wake of the recession and there was like uh, budgetary issues. And yet it's also, they're like, hey, get more money and also be better with conservation, which there seems to be a, a bit of a conflict between the two goals. Um, and I appreciate, you know, that you are trying <laughs> to do both of those things. Um, but I, I agree uh, with other people that have spoken that right now, the place we are, we're looking into the future and it's a crisis that our kids are facing. They're, the world that they're gonna grow up in is gonna be drastically different unless we make the decisions right now that are going to be able to mitigate the crisis, you know, to some extent. <laughs> And yeah. the forest is one way we in this local community have to address climate change. And I agree that needs to be the top priority of all of us right now if we care about our kids and their future. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm curious how you addressed that conflict in you know, seeing the forest, one, is, you know, okay, it needs to solve all our budgetary problems, and two, we need to uh, be, you know, increasing our conservation goals. Um, and then, you know, what you were just saying about, oh, okay, we're, you know, we're taking this little pocket and we're protecting it for the owl and this other little pocket and we're protecting it for the marble murelets and these like rivers, we'll give them a little buffer. And so it kind of, in my mind, looks like this, you know, polka dot of protection, whereas it seems like a better strategy would be to look at the whole thing and say, is there a way we can still do logging that doesn't negatively harm all of these different species and uses this resource for carbon sequestration to its maximum potential? And that's all the logging we should be doing because those other priorities should be taking precedent if we're really talking about the greatest permanent value, permanent is the future, is do our kids have a world that's worth living in? Do we have an economy that makes sense? You know, do we have food to eat? Do we have water? You know, those things for our kids are gonna matter a whole lot more than did we maximize our timber profits in this fiscal year to meet our budgetary needs. Right. So a uh, lot there and um, I, I would say all the points that you made are um, exactly the things that we feel like we are charged to do. That these lands are public lands and they're managed for public benefits over the long term is what I would say is the very sort of synopsis, if you will. And it is about um, 
functional habitat for native fish and wildlife and providing recreational opportunities and providing benefits to rural communities. And um, there are a number of ways that that happens. And, and one of them is, a, is a, the quality of life that brings people to live in Oregon and that keeps people staying in Oregon. Um, and the other one is it uh, timber-related economies. That is part of what is expected off of this land base. And it's established in statute and rule. So our job has been, over the years, is to find, to strike that right balance. How do, that's a large, that's a, a pretty big expectation of a relatively small land base. And so our job is, how, what's the right balance? How do we represent the needs and um, expectations of Oregonians? And so to me, that's the voice that you're bringing to the table right now, characterizing what you think that balance should be. And that's why we're here. We're here to gather that and make sure that we're um, representing that with integrity to the Board of Forestry. So um, as far as uh, you know, meeting budgetary needs, I guess I want to be clear that yes, uh, we don't receive any tax dollars at all to run our program for state forests. The Department of Forestry has general fund to run other portions of what we do for the, for the agency, but there's no tax dollars for managing these lands. And that does put us in a position of, um, we're reliant, obviously, on timber revenue. There's no other significant source of revenue. So we're reliant on that to implement these programs. And if that revenue is not sufficient, then many of the benefits that you're talking about are really hard to deliver. A classic one is recreation. We spend about $3.5 million a year on our recreation program. So how do we make sure that that's adequately funded? Uh, we spend a lot of money on research and monitoring. We want to make sure that's adequately funded. So there's a lot of pieces to what we're doing. Um, we are and have s uh, several times pursued other sources of revenue. We've gone to the legislature and said, perhaps we should get some general fund for these other things that we provide, which would lessen the pressure. Uh, we haven't been successful there. It's a, you know, a small pie with a lot of demand on the general fund. So I get that. So I wanted to put, put that out there. Um, we do have an approach. We haven't gotten into it uh, in, in the current plan, and it would carry over somewhat into, into if we were to revise the plan, which provides connectivity to speak to your polka dot question, comment. You're, that is a, not um, the best way to provide for uh, high quality habitat and functional habitat. So that's a fragmented, landscape and what you're saying is there needs to be, here's what I'm hearing anyway, there needs to be greater connectivity in how we think about managing the land. That's in our current approach. We have what's called landscape design on how we would do that. And if we ended up, uh, if this ended up being adopted by the board, we would uh, also have that same uh, goal and that's written in that section on wildlife. All that being said, I, you know, what you're, I'm hearing what you're saying, which is you think you know, there's an argument for the balance to lean away from timber and and more towards conservation and the things that need to be done there. And I, you're representing a, a large voice in, for Oregonians that feel that way. I would I would just like to add. Um, I'm also the budget and finance director for Clatsop County, and any opportunity I have to educate people on the budget process, I will take. And thank you, Liz, for speaking to how the timber dollars help the state, but there were also com uh, comments made regarding how timber dollars are used in the county for services. And over 20 years ago, our board of commissioners took, um, took action in our long-term financial plan to only budget the 15-year low of timber harvest. And so of our $23 million general fund budget, 2.18 is what we budgeted for timber. And then anything in excess goes into reserves um, should there be shortages in future years um, because we never know you know, what might happen to the forests, for example, the 2007 windstorm that took down significant trees, or should there be a catastrophic fire like there was to the Tillamook Forest. So, so that's the approach that the Clatsop County commissioners have taken as far as being fiscally responsible, um, using those timber dollars and budgeting for those timber dollars.
Uh, I wanted to ask a couple questions. Picking up on Ted's issue with Splash, uh, this is, uh, it's actually one question, but two parts. Uh, I'm uh, interested in knowing what exploration of chipping uh, of Slash has been uh, in, encountered. Uh, and by spreading the Slash, when you chip it, just leave it where you found it uh, to, to distribute it. And how that is impacts um, carbon sequestration. Uh, we have done some chipping, but uh, it was more um, chipping and then hauled off site to uh, like Wana Mill for for their use there. Um, but that's really dependent on um, the cost of fuel, just you know to make it uh, economically feasible for the people who do that work. Um, fuel cost to get that product to a mill site. Uh, sometimes it's real, the margins are real tight on that, so um, it's, it's real dependent on fuel prices, I guess. And then just to chip it, just to run the chipper to do that, fuel for that takes a lot of fuel also. So um, so we haven't done it th as often. I was asking not so much about chipping it off site, but leaving it as compost. Yeah, and again, it, it comes down to expenses as far as what's, it, it's, it, it is cheaper for us to, um, to you know, pile it and and burn it, um, and then you you'd be surprised at how much uh, product is made from chipping those piles. And again, you have um, you know you have the fire hazard created from that. Plus, again, the the planting spots being able to you know have planting spots in those just in the summertime when, during our loose bark period. Uh, if you've ever been to one of our um, uh, landings after they've harvested just the amount of bark that comes off just from uh, limbing the trees is amazing and it's sometimes it's hard even to get planting spots in that we actually ask our operators to uh, clear some of those make planting spots with their equipment when they're there because it's a lot of that stuff so deep I will say it depends on the district too some districts are looking at the costs associating with piling wood and questioning whether there's it's the pros outweigh the cons um, and trying to figure out what scenarios are scenarios where they wouldn't do it um, and there's some science that's come out there's been a lot of science through time but there's some recent science suggesting that exactly the sort of nutrient and moisture pulse associated with that wood has value for seedling survival and so there's folks internally talking about it it hasn't built its way into a formal policy discussion yet and I guess I'd add on, on the east half of our county out towards the Jewel area where there's more, <coughs> more Douglas fir, the amount of piling we have to do is less just because the fuel load is less, uh, less limbs on a lot of those trees. Where on, as you get closer to the Columbia River, or to the coast, uh, where you get a, a mix of uh, spruce and hemlock that have more um, limbs and just a heavier concentration of that. And, you know, and part of, the, of piling and burning is also to reduce fire hazard risk in the summertime. Mm -hmm. So we've been going for, uh, okay, I was going to, then maybe a break. I hope this is a short question. I want to go back to the very beginning. The title of the slide is Ecological Forestry. But I also want to roll in a couple of things that have been brought up uh, relative to climate change. Um, for one thing, and, and for uh, connectivity of habitats. and. Um, so I'll take those little bites first. Um, connectivity of the habitats, I'm wondering if uh, there's any effort made to take some of our parts of the state forest that are kind of a patchwork. They're kind of little checkerboard pieces of, of, of for state forest among, in amongst uh, privately held forest and to see if there's any mechanism for doing strategic exchanges of land to build a more coherent boundary around a state forest where you could really do something with the habitat connectivity issue and maybe do a better job of protecting some of the watersheds that supply water mm -hmm. uh, to our communities. So that's, that's one part of this uh, ecological forestry question. It's hard to be ecological when you've just got this checkerboard. The other thing goes back to climate change and uh, the ability of these forests 
to be of value because they store carbon? And why cannot uh, that be an assessment of uh, a permanent value that we've obtained from the forests that's um, in many cases worth more than the uh, timber that's harvested from them? Uh, why can't that be accounted for and why can't we uh, charge industry that's polluting our atmosphere with a lot of carbon dioxide to pay out money for keeping our forests alive and sequestering carbon. So those are kind of side issues to the whole question on ecological forestry. My basic question is how do you, um, how have you come about trying to understand what our forest should be like ecologically? I, I go back, you know, 15,000 years before anybody, any human was here on the continent. What was the forest like then? I know we were coming out of an ice age, so things have changed since then. Now we're facing climate change, and so the ecology will change with that. But for this plan, how do you establish what your vision of a healthy, natural forest is. Do you try to go back and, and from the history books determine what it was like before we started cutting the heck out of the forest 200 years ago? Anyway, just I know it's a long, could be a question that you could spend weeks talking mm -hmm. to me about, but just do it in ten min, in five uh, sentences. You want to take that first? I'll take the land exchange. Yeah. So as far as uh, land exchange, we have uh, an active land exchange plan. We have, it's actually, um, I think it's an administrative rule that we're supposed to try to consolidate uh, the lands we manage to make it more efficient, our management. And that's been going on in the class up at least for 40 plus years. And um, if I, I, there is a PowerPoint put together, Ron, Ron uh, Zilli built it, um, but it shows how the class ups changed our ownership over this time period and uh, we have done a lot to consolidate our lands. We still do have a few scattered tracks, but not not really not that many as compared on some of our forests it's even it's more more uh, checkerboarded but the clouds that we're, we're, we're very fortunate um, um, to have fairly consolidated lands and, and most of our lands are on the east half of the county um, so um, and we still do uh, have an active a plan, um, and we, we have an actual, every district has a, a land exchange plan for their district, so people that are interested in exchanging with us can look at, and see what parcels we're interested in, and, and, and uh, so um, we do get approached from time to time, uh, but it also it's, there's a, a lot of expense that goes into a land exchange plan with appraisals and everything, and it's a kind of a longer process that usually takes up to three years to do, and sometimes even longer. Uh, so finding a partner that's willing to wait three years to go through that process is sometimes hard. Um, but, uh, and then budgetarily, be, because of where we've been in the last 10 years, we haven't had that many. Uh, the most recent land exchange that we've done on the Clatsop State Forest was, uh, was with the city of Cannon Beach. It was a three-way exchange with the city of Cannon Beach and um, Hampton uh, uh, Tree Farms. Um, for the E. coli tract that's behind the city of Cannon Beach, and we acquired some lands that were adjacent to our lands out in, um, in the Jewel area. And I think there was even a piece up in the Astoria Basin uh, up off the Pipeline Road. So we, that was the most recent one we've done. Maybe, but there's a couple other questions you had. Did you, yeah, you want to take does someone want to speak to this? Yeah, um, you know, when we talk about climate change and carbon sequestration and that, there's a couple of pieces to that. Um, a primary focus for us, and you'll see it in the plan, is the resiliency of our forest. So as climate changes, as the risk of catastrophic fire, extreme weather events, what have you, anything that may be related to that increase, we need to have, again, not all of our eggs in one basket. Um, and ways to address that uncertainty. And so that goes to the ecolo ecological forestry perspective, uh, you know, basically the same way. You're doing a lot of different things everywhere. Um, and so that's, that's always important. It is also important to address the sequestration question. Um, and we do have overall a building inventory in terms of total volume. 
right. there's a couple of pieces to that that uh, we're not really I don't have any specifics to speak to today but the department as a whole is looking at uh, carbon storage in uh, manufactured wood products that do not you know decay very fast and then also carbon uh, sequestration carbon flux in a uh, forest as well and from a market conditions standpoint um, really that's a more general and you know basically we're at the mercy of market conditions like everybody else um, there is a break-even point actually where the trees on the stump in terms of carbon and being able to sell carbon credits become worth as much as uh, you know as, as timber but we're a long way from that at this point depending on how you know public opinion and values go that gap could close relatively quickly and in terms of our relationships with the counties and our own budgets for instance it kind of doesn't matter where that money comes from it would it would certainly be a factor for industrial stakeholders in terms of if, if that were to reduce timber harvest somehow but in terms of a, you know the county getting revenue and us getting revenue to operate that piece it's it's sort of doesn't matter what the product is, if you will. It's a different question. Do you want to speak to a historical range, or do you want me to range of areas? <laughs> uh, so on the sort of historical range of variation uh, piece, and yeah, uh, so we think about, we have thought as far back as glaciation, because one of my counterparts likes to point out how we didn't have dug fur for us prior to that, uh, and sort of the ephemeral nature of everything. Um, that's a little cynical for my taste. Uh, looking back through the literature and looking at how um, the current plan is developed, it's very much rooted in our understanding at the time of the historical range of variation on the landscape. And so there's a section in the current plan actually that speaks to some, you know, when you look sort of across, particularly the coast range in Oregon uh, through the record prior to European settlement, our understanding is about 40 to 70% of any landscape was old at any given point in time. Uh, and that is the basis for our plans framework of th currently 30 to 50% of the forest is uh, intended to be an old forest structure is the desired future condition. And that that 30 to 50% be arranged in a functionally in a functional design for wildlife, meaning considers connectivity and interior habitat uh, and distribution of habitat across the landscape. So current plan's very much rooted in that. State, it's, there's not a lot to say that there is something that should be dramatically different from that. Uh, yet we know that systems change through time and we're on, in a period of change. And so the intent is to uh, build as much resilience and adaptability as we can into the forest. And yeah, that's obviously not gonna be through um, large, you know, a forest managed entirely on short rotations of dug fur. <clears throat> so uh, could it is, so maybe the last question here, and I, I think, I know I need a break, so I'm guessing everyone else does too. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a comment on the consolidation of lands which sounds like a really great idea from an ecological standpoint. But here in our county, we've had a couple of uh, aberrant situations uh, that have developed that have really make us question uh, some of the motivation, I guess, of the Department of Forestry. And one is that uh, apparently the, the area down around uh, Norriston Heights, that, that uh, patch that's supposed to be uh, clear cut, is the only piece of land on the coast that that the forestry department uh, manages. Everything else is out in East County. So on the basis of the argument of consolidation, that kind of makes sense. Uh, you know, take down that. You won't have to deal with that or think about that little tiny parcel over there along the coast. But the problem is it's, uh, it's in a highly touristed area. Uh, the uh, potential mural habitat, a lot of other potential values uh, having to do with recreation and so forth. And meanwhile, we, we've been given a little scruffy little patch out in East County somewhere. It was photographed in the Oregonian that uh, was designated a conservation area, which is a, a really scruffy piece of land that had a, 
had a quarry on it and a bunch of old uh, refrigerators and stuff lying around. And that's what we've been given for a conservation area. It seems like somebody's got their priorities backwards. And uh, I understand that the Department of Forestry is in dire financial straits right now, $100 million worth of uncollected uh, revenue from firefighting efforts over five years. And I understand why they're trying to log areas that are high value, like the Norriston Heights, which are also close to roads, which means there's very little expenditure to get those logs out. So I understand that from a budgetary standpoint, but I just think that in terms of overall values and, and moral values, that, that, should, uh, that particular piece of ground should be turned into a conservation area. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, we talk almost casually about climate change and, and uh, carbon sequestration and uh, uh, what do you call it when you buy in carbon credits and all that. I don't see it, I mean, it's all, that's all framed in a, in a kind of a market financial uh, framework. And to me, at this point, climate change is a moral issue. I mean, we've had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have already died because of the effects of climate change. And uh, what we do here in our state contributes to the overall situation. So I just think we need to start thinking more in terms of moral values on these issues, not so much just the economics of uh, forestry. So I, I just <clears throat> would like to speak to that and say I agree with, uh, I want to be very clear, and I think we've all been very clear in whichever circles we're talking in, is that climate change is arguably the most pressing issue in terms of uh, uh, social, economic, and environmental conditions. So by any measure, um, we're in it and we need to uh, address it. So um, in terms of the forest management plan, we are largely proposing an adaptive approach so that it, we recognize up front in a guiding principle, and I can point it out when we go through this draft, um, the impacts of climate change and the need for carbon sequestration as two critical tools and that we have to be able to adapt as things continue to change. And in order to do that, we have to have um, an applied adaptive um, management approach uh, that makes sure that we're understanding forest health and how that's being might be being impacted by climate change and what species we're planting, et cetera, impacts on stream temperature from climate change. Do we manage differently around streams that are more susceptible to climate change, et cetera? So to me, that's very clear. Um, the, uh, you had another question there I wanted to address, but if, oh, the um, issue around Norston Heights. And um, there was a lot of public outcry about that. And uh, we came here um, and, list, and we, we got the letters. The letters went to the governor's office, the Board of Forestry. We came here and, and listened to people firsthand and ended up pulling that out of our sale plan. So it's no longer part of a sale plan. Um, and there was conversations at that meeting when we were here, and I can't remember uh, when that was, several months ago, maybe during the summer, and started a conversation about a land exchange uh, for that possibly as well. However, and maybe to, to some concerns around, you know, what do those land exchanges look like from an ecological perspective, um, not just a financial perspective, is this upcoming session of the legislature, it's only a month long and it's in February, um, there's going to be a bill being considered for a forest transfer bill, is what it's called. And that would add another tool in our toolbox. So we have land exchanges, we can purchase land, and this provides another tool that might allow us to transfer lands um, in, into a different use. So transfer not so much from one owner to another, but transfer into a use that may be more focused on conservation. Um, but thinking about that imbalance of the entire land base. I, and, and one more thing on climate change, yeah, when we think about carbon sequestration, it, it is not just about financial. It is about, you know, ultimately, everything we're talking about here is a trade-offs conversation. 
you know, it's not comfortable. People don't want to think it about think about it that way, but it really is. And it actually goes to, I think, your question around you're trying to increase conservation and, and financial outcomes. Like, you know, what's the reality of being able to do that? Our job is to say, here's how that that might look. Here are the trade-offs. Now, Board of Forestry, this is your time to make a decision around, here's what we're hearing from the public. Here's how you might evaluate trade-offs. Now, how do you want us to move forward? So carbon sequestration is part of that, or a carbon market, if you will, and the benefits ecologically is part of that conversation. And this will be the final thing I'll say before the break, but um, it is our duty as managing these public lands to uh, manage them responsibly in, in, and as stewards of the public. And uh, we are wholeheartedly dedicated to that. We restored these lands from burnt and cut over lands. There was, it was uh, really referenced, these lands were referenced as worthless. There's quotes about that from historical documents. So I have a lot of pride in the Department of Forestry and our state forest staff and our folks that are out on the ground because the reason we have what we have out here and the ecological benefits and the habitat for fish and wildlife and the highest water quality comes off of forest land is because of the good stewardship of these lands. And I feel like it's incumbent on me as the you know, leadership of this division to really stand up for that. Um, and with that said, there is only so much 3% of the forest land base can do um, in terms of meeting these really um, complex expectations of Oregonians. Um, but we're up for the challenge, and, and it's our job to represent and implement our forest management in a way that the public expects. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's the adaptation process. So sorry for the soapbox, um, but we'll, why don't we take a 10 minute break and we'll be back here at uh, 1040. So let me get your contact info. Let's do it that way. Can you just write it? that are going on internally don't always translate out into the public sphere, you know, but we're having all sorts of, like, frankly, we're having big arguments internally about how to uh, and, like, Ty and I get along and we get on other things, but not on that, you know, it's, it's all sorts of little things like that, you know, uh, and the future, you guys aren't going to see, yes, 30 to 50 percent of our forest is going to go presentation it doesn't mean it's, it's going to it's not going to be land somewhere and so that's that somewhere in some document it's not going to, we're not going to commit to that and so a couple things is kind of understanding where stuff lives in this framework so that you can say I'd like to see this like I want to see this you know and understand it's like all right well I don't see it there but I'm going to need to see it over here if you like, if you want my mom, because um, like the thirty to you know, we're gonna commit to some large portion of our landscape. Right. Uh, this plan, not specific. That's what I'm saying. So, so try and understand. Let's keep talking about where we see. It. We're gonna explain right now where we see it. Seems living. like you can do it where we want. So we. Been that the 
best place to put it in a place where we could change it <laughs> because things change, but like put that in a, in a rigorous public process uh, and adaptive management where it's like should data inform data and public input and change and not just arbitrary, you know, chasing some revenue target or something. Uh, the title's changed. He's, and he's my Mike's going to really show how, where we, all the stuff that he wants to see. But you're not gonna it's see. running now. It's going to run. The important thing is yeah, it seems to sort of understand where it lives and where you can focus you know, what you want. No, no. You know, and understand the limitations of what this is. But we are we are eight. We are eighty-seven percent of the public land. That's a camp. Yeah. That's it. So yeah, we're not a big deal at the coast range scale, but up here it matters quite a bit.
Let's get started. It's so funny to look up at that. MP organization. First of all, I wanted to thank everybody for being here today. Um, I know it's a long meeting, there's a lot of complex information. Um, this is the type of information that um, ODF presents to the um, Forest Trust Land Advisory Committee. Um, and so I have heard this presentation before, and I'm really uh, happy that they were able to come, take the time to come out to Clatsop County um, to help us with this. And feel free to pick up these materials, and if you want to pick some up to share with your neighbors, um, go ahead and do that. Um, but one thing I do want to say, and I appreciate all the comments, um, but there is a lot of material. Um, so what, if it's okay with you all, we would like to um, move forward with the with with the agenda and then at the end maybe have more comments if that's okay um, they are going to have a public comment period um, January 14th down in Salem January 14th is another meeting uh, like this and then the uh, comments period closes uh, January 31st and so what we were hoping with this meeting here is that to get this uh, hard copy of the plan although it's also online out into, out into everybody's hands so you have a chance to study it and look at it and then when you make your comments there'll be uh, more informed um, comments so if that's okay with everybody we'll I'll, I'll turn this back over to this to these folks thanks did you want to say something Mike yeah and, uh, 
uh, just to clarify, when we talk about uh, uh, January 31st closing, that's like a public input period on this. Then we'll go back, we'll be presenting a revised forest management plan to the board in April, like Liz was saying. But then that'll be put aside while we do more work on the HCP. Before a new plan or revised plan would actually be adopted, the board would have to go through the rulemaking process, which has its own additional right. public comment period and everything. So um, while we really want your input now up front, we really, it helps us the most to have it early. Um, it's not going to be your last chance either. Right. And uh, public comment uh, period, there's public comment at the Board of Forestry meeting itself. And we talked about this, you know, I talked about this before we started this morning, which is um, you can always submit written comments if you can't make it to that board meeting. There's an email uh, address. You could send an email to Board of Forestry really anytime you want on um, topics that are of your concern. So there's all kinds of way to keep that um, input going. But thank you, Kathleen. So we will um, sort of carry on here. Um, and that isn't to uh, squash any questions and discussion, but kind of want to just keep making sure we get stuff and explain what's in front of you. Because Kathleen's right, there's a lot of information here. So one, the, you know, the largest document being the draft forest management plan itself. So it's titled the Western Oregon State Forest Management Plan 2020. Um, and mostly I'm kind of, I'm just gonna introduce you to how the document is organized. So there's the table of contents here that starts on I, page II, lowercase ii. And you can see how everything's laid out there. So um, chapter one that starts on um, page one is an introduction. So it describes um, the, uh, how the state forests were established and the governance of those forests, where they're located, um, the purpose and scope for managing these lands, the planning processes, um, and a description of the forest resources that to me is, a, a, I think, a really informative section of the plan and you get a really good uh, snapshot of what the forests and the forest resources are like on our um, forest today. And then uh, chapter two is the vision and guiding principles. And so this starts to get into a little bit more of, uh, I guess I would say the nitty gritty of what it is um, that we're trying to achieve on these lands. So there's a vision statement up front um, around ecosystem services. This is where, um, give credit to Nick Pausato. Um, he's the one that's really dug in and, and written the section on ecological forestry. Um, so that's in here as well. Um, and then towards the end of that chapter, starting on page 93, is a set of guiding principles. So um, Justin went over what is actually required to be in a forest management plan, and this is one of the requirements. And so we actually took just the guiding principles to the Board of Forestry um, about a year and a half ago now, and they reviewed these. We took them, we got a lot of public feedback on these, and the Board has actually approved these 11 guiding principles. So we've, there's a lot in here, and I, I'm not going to really get into them, but I'm pointing you to those, so hopefully you can take a good look at those. We've talked a lot about climate change, so if you look at page 98, uh, guiding principle number 11 is that the forest management plan will be implemented to adapt to climate change and mitigate its impacts on the management of state forest lands. The FMP will also contribute to climate change mitigation and sequester carbon. With the guiding, and, and really that's, they are exa exactly that, a guiding principle. This is the overarching, um, pr the set of principles upon which everything else that is in this plan is gonna be based. Um, so that's in chapter two. And then chapter three is a set of goals, strategies, and measurable outcomes. Um, and now we're getting more into resource by resource, very, uh, a lot, more specificity, if you will, um, in terms of what are the goals for managing for these resources like timber, wildlife, uh, aquatic resources, uh, what strategies are we going to implement to get there and what are the measurable outcomes. And then um, if you move on to um, chapter four, which starts on page 120, 
These are the set of guidelines that Justin talked about. It's being required also in a force management plan. So it's um, you know operational policies and standards as well as op, um, implementation, adaptive management, asset management. And then towards the back, there's a set of appendices that um, provide a little bit more detail on some of the species and um, and um, glossary and index of the terminology, et cetera. So that's how the plan is organized. Again, one of the goals today was really just to literally kind of introduce you and um, ground you in that. So I, I want to start with this handout. You all should have hopefully have picked up at the table. Thank you. And so it's this flow chart. And we can, did it, does everyone have that? It's a lot easier to. It's also on page 122. Thank you. It's also on page 122. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about this. Um, it, a consistent feedback we've been getting is, and I think I heard it a little bit already, um, perhaps in one of the comments when we first started, is a desire to see more specificity in the forest management plan. And so I just want to speak a little bit to why would we are suggesting the approach that we're taking. And it's um, the forest management plan itself is an organ administrative rule. So this, what is close to 200 pages were the board to eventually adopt it. That is considered an organ administrative rule. So as things change and we learn more, if we need to change something specific like a riparian buffer width um, in the plan, we have to open up that whole plan and go through an administrative rule process with public um, sort of going through that whole process, it's fairly extensive, even if we're just changing one thing in the plan. So we're thinking, how can we, ha where can that specificity live in a way that allows us to adapt more quickly? Um, and, it's, you know, we've been working on this since 2012. So anything we've learned that we needed to change and accommodate may have changed again since 2012. So it's, it's very clunky and not very well suited for adaptive management if all the standards are simply, are all incorporated into the forest management plan. So um, what is contained in this draft are the things that I've just talked about. And in the model that we're setting up, the notion would be that, in fact, the, the, um, the way it is established right now is the Board of Forestry, they are the de decision-making body for the forest management plan. That's their jurisdiction, it's their policy. We serve, really, their needs and direction. Um, uh, going off to the right is another key um, piece of this uh, setup that we're proposing, is that we have a, a consistent, frequent feedback loop with the Board of Forestry through what's called a set of performance measures. We have those right now. We have nine performance measures. We're proposing we, we keep that same model, three for environmental benefits, three for social benefits, and three for economic benefits. And currently, there's one for financial viability that addresses how to, what's the right way to fund state forests. So that would remain in place as a way to you know, frequently get back to the board and say if the plan is achieving uh, the goals that we're trying to achieve. But then um, when it gets to, so, so that's the, is this the pointer? That's top, yeah. It's not very bright. There you oh, there it is. OK. So that's this portion. Below, so this is sort of the Board of Forestry realm. So below the dotted line is, as things currently stand and would remain the same, this decision making is, happens at different levels. So we go from a forest management plan to an implementation plan that basic, that takes the rules, or, or excuse me, the goals and strategies in the forest management plan and describes how we're going to implement that on the ground. Each district has an implementation plan. So while an FMP is, covers the entire geographic region we're proposing west of the Cascades, the implementation plan is at a smaller scale. It drills down and says, all right, you've got all these strategies for the, a larger geographic area. For Astoria, for Clatsop County, how's that going to actually be implemented? 
Those, and those are mid-term, um, in a temporal sense, sort of mid, um, mid-level. So right now we think of them as 10-year plans. But we do, we do um, revise those uh, sometimes in, in shorter time frames, sometimes longer time frames. Then it drills down into, and excuse me, the implementation plans are um, approved by the um, director of the Department of Forestry, so the state forester. Then it goes into operation plans. And that drills down even in smaller spatial and temporal scales. So right now we have annual operation plans and those describe specific harvest plans, if it's gonna be thin or clear cut, how much volume would come out of there, what kind of recreation um, facilities are gonna be built, are there gonna be additional trails built, what kind of reforestation, restoration projects, et cetera, all on the district at the district level. So there's the spatial and temporal drilling down. And these operation plans are signed by um, the district forester. And then funding, you know, that influences funding levels and also funding levels influence, you know, there's a, a, there's a feedback loop that goes on here as well. So that's how we're set up right now. The current plan has some specific standards in it. So there's specific standards for stream protection and wetland protection, and then there's some guidelines um, and targets for amount of complex structure and how many trees we should leave on the landscape. Everything else in it is, and there's a book about this thick, is in what we call operational policies. And those operational policies deal with uh, road construction and maintenance, um, a lot more specificity around protecting owls and murelets, um, salvage, you know, proper ways to conduct salvage. Um, I'm missing, obviously, with a book this thick, there's a lot in there. But that's, that is where there's a, a very detailed approach that the folks on the ground can pick up and understand exactly what needs to happen to achieve, uh, properly implement the forest management plan. So that's right here. Those are those operational policies, and that's where we have a lot of uh, standards. So, um, and then in this framework, uh, we've got, you know, critical, as Nick said, is our, an adaptive management program um, with quantifiable targets. So we've got these measurable outcomes and performance measures that are measurable outcomes in the plan, related performance measures. Those need quantifiable targets. We learn if we're achieving our goals. If we say, if we learn that, huh, we need wider riparian buffers, and we've got a quantifiable target for that, and we monitor and we say, yeah, you know, we're not achieving our goals for some uh, function about aquatics, and all of our standards are in operational policies, we can change those really quickly. If we were to keep, if we were to keep this model of having these standards here, what we need to do is really um, raise the profile of those, really make sure all of our, the public and our stakeholders are understanding what's going on on the ground and have a voice in what that looks like. So we think this is a, a really good way to be nimble and to change with new information. The public, oh shoot dang. So, uh, but what we are hearing is a, is a fair amount of discomfort with that. These policies are approved by the deputy state forester and um, she, you know, she reviews those and approves those um, and so what we're hearing from folks is either they want to have more input in this or actually they'd rather see the standards up here under the board's jurisdiction. So we're, we're coming up with some ideas around how to address that, but I just wanted to make sure you all know we're hearing that. We're really think, you know, we're going to present some options eventually to the board around how they would like that to be addressed. Um, because they're not an Oregon administrative rule, they can, we're able to make those changes more quickly. Um, have I forgotten anything about this chart? <laughs> so I'll pause there. Any questions about that? You haven't gone down to the funding level. Well, I actually think we need to improve this flow chart. This is kind of hanging out there in a strange way in my mind, but really, um, 
we, you know, as I said, we're funded through the sale of timber so that, you know, what's actually happening on the ground is going to determine how much money we have, which then determines, you know, how much we can invest um, in this example in adaptive management. But it also addresses, you know, how we're going to implement the plan and in turn what we can really do in terms of actual operations and recreation on the ground. So there's a feedback loop that I don't think we're really representing very well here. Anyone want to add to that part of the graphic? Well, you'll be talking about that. You go in more too. depth in the funding yeah. levels in a later slide. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Oh, yes. Well, the implementation plans, you were saying that that's uh, sort of 10-year plans with the state forester, and then the operational plans are the district forester. Is it also about 10 years? The operation plans are right now annually. So their annual operation plans as we're, we've done some internal uh, restructuring of how we're organized. And so we're thinking if there's a, another way to do that that actually can bring public engagement in sooner in the process. You know, if you're just, if the public is looking at a year at a time, you don't get the big picture. We're not able to change according to what we're hearing from you. So we're, that's why we're just calling them operation plans right now rather than annual operation plans. So, that's the intent. Hand it over to Mike. I can't see behind me. Um, so that actually never really did me again. So for non ODF retired or current employees in the audience. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, who don't work or have worked in the past for ODF, uh, for everybody else, who is aware of our implementation plan process? And who's aware of our annual operations plan process? And of course, you're aware of the FMP process to some extent because you're here today, and that's great. One of the things that we we have this implementation plan process, and like Liz say, says, it currently lays out usually a 10-year objective. That's where our annual harvest objectives are. That's where our desired future condition for the landscape is for complex habitat. And it's kind of this missing piece in the engagement model. There is a public comment period for it, but we never get any public comments on it. Folks are almost completely disengaged from it. And so one of the things that we really want to do with the new plan is provide a more deliberate structure around our decision making that reaches out more to actively engage stakeholders, public, county partners, everybody, to really get in there. Now, let me see, how does this go back? Okay, as Liz pointed out, Board decision-making space is up here. Down here, this is all with the state forester and below. State forester, district forester. That's not going to change in terms of the actual approval process. The state forester is ultimately responsible for um, implementation plan approval. District foresters. Uh, we probably, well, actually, we're changing that a little bit, so I'm not going to speak for Ron about how that might play out. So we're not talking about changing who approves these things. But we are talking about how we're going to be doing it. We're going to be using a process called structured decision making, and that is a process that's been adopted by the Interior Department uh, for a number of years now. And what it is, is it kind of follows the adaptive management cycle and makes the adaptive management cycle implementable and meaningful. One of the problems with adaptive management, generally speaking, in natural resources is it fails. And one of the reasons it fails is we go out and we do a lot of good monitoring of, of these questions. And there's never been any structure around how are we going to use that information to make a decision. What what areas of uncertainty are we trying to clarify through monitoring that we're going to need to change? 
And so what we want to do is use this cycle, which is really similar to the adaptive management cycle, where we have stakeholders involved in a lot of key steps. So the first step is to clarify the decision context. So everybody comes together, and we do not have, by the way, the nuts and bolts of what kind of group we would form, how often it would convene, and that sort of thing. But we would be convening a group, and it would be a standing group of some sort with some kind of schedule, where we clarify the decision context. Some of that is set in the FMP, but most of it is actually set by current conditions. And you know, basically, there's a lot of values in there. Then we define the objectives and measures associated with this particular implementation. And so this really flies with the, or dovetails with the implementation plan process. And so we would be defining objectives and measures for any given implementation period, whether that continues to be 10 years or it's some other number. This is where the measurable outcomes that you see in the plan which are very high level, and I'll get to that in a minute. They're very high level, very broad, and they don't have targets associated with them. This is where we take quantifiable targets from the adaptive management plan and feed those things in here. So we have actual targets that we're looking for for these objectives. Okay. Then we develop alternatives around how we might manage for the, over that implementation period. And then stakeholder involvement stops for a minute while we go and estimate the consequences of that. That's on us. We're going to go and we're going to do forest modeling, harvest schedule modeling, habitat modeling. We have a lot of different things we can bring to bear on that, but that is a department responsibility. And then we come back with an understanding of the outputs of those models, and stakeholders are involved in the evaluation of those trade-offs and the selection of the final alternative. And then, again, it's on us then to go out and implement that plan, conduct the monitoring, and then provide a review process where the whole thing starts again at the next implementation. Now, this requires a lot of engagement and a lot of work and it has to be a heavily facilitated and collaborative process. It's where real, really people can get in there and roll up their sleeves and work with us on what they really want to see out of the forest. It follows the implementation plan cycle because it's a bite-sized chunk. It's something people can relate to. It's better than the AOP process, which... AOP? You know, what? You said AOP. Yeah. Might want to explain it. Are yeah, it's is? better than the annual operations process, which is basically we're putting something out there, and it's already pretty well planned out, and we'd like your comments, but it's happening next fiscal year. It's, a, it's oh, wow, this is happening now. Forest management plan, very high level. This is happening over 100 years. Just using a decadal uh, context here, most people can relate to, okay, I see what we're doing over the next 10 years. I can ask questions about what that might, uh, what, what the outputs of that ought to be. And then, you know, we can model that out, get an idea. It's just a good space for people to work in and one that was kind of underutilized right now. But when I say facilitated and collaborative, that does not necessarily mean consensus. And it doesn't necessarily mean that some people are going to feel like they're not getting everything they want out of it. As a matter of fact, nobody's going to feel like they're getting everything they want out of it. But in the monitoring here of these objectives and measures that we've set, we'll understand if we're hitting those targets at the end of this implementation. And if we're not, we can make the adjustment. And that's the other thing that goes back to uncertainty in, that we were talking about in the context of ecological forestry is we're not making a commitment that we're not as afraid to make the commitment because we know we will be able to adjust at the end of the implementation. If we've gotten something wrong, we can adjust that and do better. We'll have learned more about how to, through the monitoring, about how to estimate the consequences. 
So it's, a, it's an iterative process that really refines the targets, the objectives, everything as we go along. Okay. Can I just add real quickly? I think the, um, the, the way that this succeeds the best is, is with that stakeholder engagement. One of the reasons is it makes sure we're looking at the things that matter to you. We can sit back and, and come up with what we think is most important and focus on that. But with the stakeholder engagement, we're focusing on the right things. We know what matters to people. We know what they're concerned about. We know what those questions are. So we collectively work through those together. Thanks. And there's a wide range of stakeholders, correct? There is a wide range of stakeholders. So like I said, we don't know what the, what, we don't know what the group specifically looks like yet. We have to iron that out kind of through the adaptive management plan process and figure out how these things actually come together. Um, since it's sort of a new thing for us to engage in this particular way. But, um, you know, we have our State Forest Advisory Committee that currently meets uh, and advises us on operational issues. And that really has been a success, uh, that committee, and it has a broad variety of interests. And it's exactly the kind of, uh, sort of the different dynamic that we're looking for and that, that group is really productive for us. And they, they really roll up their sleeves and they get into it and they provide us really specific, meaningful comment. Uh, more so than when we're asking folks, you know, to comment on something kind of nebulous and high level. And so that, that experience alone is, is sort of one of the things that's really making us think that that's a good model for engagement um, uh, with this new plan to make it uh, formal. I would add as well, so then also the context of the annual operations, uh, you will understand more clearly, theoretically, you would understand more clearly the goals for any given year, how they relate to what we're trying to achieve over those 10 years. And also, so there, there's likely still, and you may still have questions about that at the annual scale or about individual sales, but in theory, you understand how they relate to that that longer term goal a little bit more clearly. Yes. The measurable outcomes and quantifiable targets, uh, are, are those part of the stakeholder involvement or? Repeat the question. After the <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so the question was whether the measurable outcomes um, and quantifiable targets and so forth are are also part of the public process or the stakeholder engagement process and the answer is yes so we've already we held a measurable outcomes workshop in october right no september, september. september. time flies when you're having fun um, and we got feedback on those measurable outcomes and described the process uh, this was actually part of that presentation to describe the process as to how they would be used the quantifiable targets themselves that go with the measurable outcomes will be part of the adaptive management plan development, which will have, uh, it's a little bit behind the rest of the FMP, but it will have uh, the same type of stakeholder involvement. We incorporated what we heard. Mm -hmm. We incorporated what we heard on the measurable outcomes. Report. Yeah, and, and actually there's a measurable outcomes, re the reports here, right? Measurable outcomes report up there uh, from that workshop that shows uh, in detail how we incorporated the input from that workshop. And that's a good. Oh, oh. The time interval. The the time interval. I uh, well, we see it flowing with the implementation plan cycle, for the most part. Um, there is the potential that monitoring could show something, uh, especially something that needed to be corrected sooner rather than later in the implementation plan before it's ended that we could that we could still react to uh, because not all monitoring of all these things are going to actually flow some of the questions uh, around habitat development for in, uh, for instance aren't going to be answered just in a 10-year cycle we might have a good idea of, of the trend of how it would go so anything that's functioning on that kind of time horizon whether it's eight years 10 years 12 years whatever it ends up being uh, won't necessarily be answered, but the process would flow along that same, would be integrated with that same implementation plan. 
I think the overall goal here is dynamite, and you're right. I mean, you, you all have heard that there is too little information too late in the process. So do you see this as the creation of another committee, which would meet in Salem? And obviously, Salem is not Clatsop County, and Clatsop County has more state forestry than any other county in the state. We are three hours from Salem. Or are you talking about community meetings so that, for instance, Norriston Heights folks would know what the plans were before it was too late? <clears throat> right, thanks. So that, um, so it would be a standing formal committee. It would be fairly critical that a lot of the same people were involved throughout the process. Um, in terms of meetings and where they happen, that sort of logistical thing could be scheduled out for people and also the representation uh, across that committee, uh, you know, could also be geographic. We want to make sure we represent not only the stakeholder interest spaces, but also the geographies involved. Yes. Can I add to that, Mike? So um, I think there's a two. So what Mike is speaking to is a structured decision making piece and how what that central stakeholder involvement looks like. There's all kinds of great technology now so that we could have representation from someone that lives in Astoria and can participate through conference calls or Zooms. And there's, I think there's ways of connecting people that are spread throughout the state, um, recognizing not everyone has the same technology available to them, but that I see that as really important and valuable. And the second, I think a different type of question that I think I was hearing from you is around public engagement using Norston Heights at that level. So how, you know, making sure that the people in this community are engaged in that process. And I'm going to ask Ron to speak to that because he's working on this very thing because we're rethinking it. Hello, Ron Zillam with State Forest Division. Uh, we're going through an organizational uh, development change as well within the division on how we do planning and coordination. So we're taking a, a fresh look at how we do public engagement. We have a centralized planning and coordination team. We just stood up this past summer, and we're going to be looking at opportunities, you know, both this year and then in out years on how we can work collaboratively with the district staffs to identify key resources that might be of interest to stakeholders, et cetera, and then you know, reach out to them. So there's awareness of what we're doing to try and better under, under, you know, explain our plans and intentions and goals for those operations in advance. So it's something we're taking a deliberate look at, and we'll be uh, continuing that conversation. Does that help? We'll see how it comes out in the wall. Yes, we will. <laughs> Right. No, I have, uh, I have a history, so I've been with the State Forest Division for over 25 years, and I've spent a lot of time here working in Clatsop County over 22 years at that time. So I'm fully aware of the community here and what the interests are, and we'll be paying attention to making sure that we're trying to make sure that we have proximate opportunities and, and timely opportunities to share things to this local community as well. Okay. Um, so... There's a piece on the measurable outcomes here as, as well uh, from the last slide. And as you go through the forest management plan, uh, you'll find the measurable outcomes for the goals. And then you will also, uh, in the uh, measurable outcomes workshop, you'll see the measurable outcomes and, and how they have been changed so far based on, based on input. Um, and they're very high level. And it's been kind of frustrating for some folks uh, looking at that, it's like, what does this mean? Maximize this, maximize that. And they appear to be competing values. Um, and they are, in fact. For instance, there's, ma there's goals around maximizing various aspects of wildlife habitat. And there's goals around maximizing uh, wood fiber available for harvest. So how does that work? And it's important to keep, uh, what we didn't want to do was constrain people limit their thinking on what they wanted. What we, we wanted to know what people valued associated with the forest management plan goals. So we didn't want to put a lid on it right away by putting people into an optimization space where they're trying to do the balancing between these things. I want this, but I know that there's going to be some of that. So, oh, what do I really want? No, it's actually just what do you really want? Um, and the optimization 
And part of it's through the structure, I mean, it is through the structured decision making process that I just showed you. But the, the optimization and the est estimation of those outcomes, that's on us. That's our job, right? So this is a really simple example, and I realize a lot of folks in this room actually have a lot of real forestry experience. Uh, so, uh, and this is not a forestry example at all, but uh, we'll just go with it because it's simple and convenient. But buying an airline ticket. And so maybe we want to fly from Portland to Washington, D.C., and there's various things that we want to either maximize or minimize. I don't want to pay any more than I have to, I want to minimize the price. I want to minimize the time of travel, maximize my comfort, and then maximize my ease of getting to my real final destination when I get there. Some airports are closer to where I'm really going than others. And so we can take these things and put them into a matrix here, along with some alternatives. And the alternatives in this case, rather than being an implementation plan alternative, are just the three airlines that we might have a choice of. And we know that we're going to have estimated consequences from that. There's going to be a price factor, time factor, comfort, ease. All these things are different uh, for each one. And so if we think about maximizing the, uh, boy, that's hard to find. Now, if we think about maximizing price or minimizing price, sorry, we might look at, you know, the airline on the left, but we also know that it's going to take a long time to get there, probably have three or four layovers. And, uh, you know, uh, the comfort's not going to be good. The seats are small, they pack them in there, that sort of thing. On the other hand, and it might be okay once we get there, though, uh, to get to our final destination. Then on the left, you know, the price is, yeah, a lot higher than that, but not the most expensive. The time in the, uh, to get there is less. Comfort is somewhere in the middle. And it's very easy to get to our final destination. And so we have this kind of matrix. Some of these things we're going to know better than others. For instance, the ease of, of getting to our final destination isn't going to change because Baltimore, Dulles, and Reagan airports aren't going to move anytime soon. So uh, that's pretty well set. There may be greater uncertainty around some of these things. Prices fluctuate for instance, and so that would be something that would be a monitoring and adaptive management question because there's uncertainty associated with it. At the end of the day, we make a choice from these uh, three alternatives, and then we monitor it and see how it goes. For, uh, and for next time, for the next implementation, we might choose differently or we might stay the same. We may find that the comfort is really not as bad as we thought it was, um, you know, on the airline on the right. And so maybe that changes the equation going forward for us. So that's an idea of how the optimization, monitoring feedback loop, and the next cycle of the uh, implementation would go. All right. Okay. <clears throat> this example is that the, uh, the group working on the, the uh, collaborative method of uh, speaking, uh, I mean, of, of making these decisions, would line out the different choices. And then together they would talk about what and come to the best choice of all these factors once they've been identified and put out there. Right? That's, that's, that's right. basically what you're saying. That's right. And the only thing that we would really be doing uh, separate from the stakeholder process is in the estimation of those consequences, which would be done through the modeling. So we have, you know, the price that we think, the comfort we think, or, or whatever, and then um, the monitoring component, and then presenting it back to stakeholders for the review so that they can, so that we can start the next cycle. And so in the process, uh, stakeholders would have a that's right. I mean, that's the transparency of it, right? It's a, how are we making this decision? Why are we making this decision? It's the tie back to that. And so when we get people better involved in the implementation and they have that 
little bit longer view that they can take uh, as opposed to the annual operations plans happening right now. I think that that will help build a lot of understanding. Well, they be setting uh, deadlines so, uh, you know, that you can, uh, you'll have to make a decision. So how will they determine when the discussion is over? Mm -hmm. So the process hasn't been totally mapped out yet, but there would be some number of meetings, uh, you know. Yeah, so, and, then, and we have talked a little bit about that for sure, and Mike's right, we haven't mapped it out yet. I, it's uh, for our goal of, of being nimble and changing and as you know quickly as we can with new information, we don't want it to be a protracted process. We don't want to, however, sacrifice public engagement. So it's finding that balance. Um, some questions are just going to take longer, just because that's you know the nature of the question. Others may turn around pretty quickly. So that would be the intention. And then part of it is cost. And I raised this right away when this was presented from our team of experts. We've hired an expert in adaptive management to help put this together. And um, the thinking is that we can frame it in a way that is affordable, efficient, and effective. So that's part of that time frame question too, Kathleen. Thank you. It really falls back to the facilitation and effective yeah. facilitation so you can get things accomplished uh, in as few meetings and, and you know as quickly as possible, still getting a good result, making sure all the feedback is adequately captured. And then there is, once the implementations once a, a, an implementation has been picked, um, we also are kind of, you know, what's the, what's the frequency with which that group would get together during the implementation just to get an update on things? You know, it might just be annual or something like that. It wouldn't be overly burdensome at that point. Okay, so that goes back to me and um, Chapter three is really what we'd like to talk about today with y'all. And um, this is the chapter starts on page 99. Really echoes. So in this slide, what I've done is just listed all the resources that are covered in this chapter. So you can see um, there's a extensive, robust uh, list of resources that, that need to be addressed in how we manage these public forests. So I'm not going to read through all those, but just calling out uh, for you um, that there are, that's the sort of breadth um, of topics that we're covering in this section. I really think of it um, as kind of the meat of the document. So what we'd like to do is just um, walk through a couple of examples, because we can't cover all of that, um, but would like to just walk you through a couple of resources to give you a feel for what's being done with this chapter, or the, yeah, for, with chapter three. Okay, and I'm going to walk us through the wildlife goals and strategies then, uh, which is page 103 is where the goals are listed. And so there's two, you know, large pri like primary goals for wildlife in the plan. The first is to foster and enhance functional and resilient systems and landscapes to support native wildlife communities. And the second is provide the variety and quality of habitat types and features necessary for long-term persistence of native species. So uh, for context, the, the, the first one sort of is you know, the, the operative words there are function, resilience, landscapes, communities. It's really about sort of larger scales. And then um, the second goal is more about individual species needs in terms of habitat types and features. You guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Strategies are on 103 and continue on to page 104. There's, there's 10 total strategies listed there, and each or several of them have a number of sub-strategies associated with them. Uh, I'm just going to present four of the high-level strategies today, so when you look at that page, you'll see a lot more there. Uh, so the first one that I'll mention is to manage for diverse habitat types across the landscape and over time. 
This is similar to what's in our current plan, uh, but it includes managing for a diverse array of serial stages and stand structures and patch sizes, uh, trying to capture the range and variation of forest types and topography and habitat features at, at the forest level and uh, protection of rare, unique, and otherwise important habitats. So making sure that we're accounting for the things that are less common on our landscape. And so what Nick's going through here, they are, um, he's picking out, like he says, highlighting a couple. So that's strategy number four, right. just so people know okay. what you're talking about. I sort of linked it to that. Do you know yeah, okay. I do. All right, so this is strategy six then that I'm mentioning next. It's manage for functional landscapes for native wildlife, uh, which speaks to one of the concerns that we've heard here today. Um, and again, it's similar to the current plans, strategies which are to provide for a variety of patch types and sizes. So that's taking into account both the diversity and the need for um, you know, larger patches which include interior habitat areas in mature forest patches specifically, so seeking um, you know, some of the most important features of ecological function for uh, our rarer species. And then also broad scale connectivity between those habitat patches. Um, next is number seven, which is to protect, maintain, and enhance habitat for species of concern and you know, so most the current plan and where we'd be moving under revised plan takes a framework of providing sort of what we call coarse filter strategies. So these sort of large scale strategies that are applied across the whole landscape. The vast majority of species are expected to benefit somehow. And there's always going to be species of concern that have very specific needs, whether they're sensitive or they have a big home range or there's just a specific structure on the landscape they desire. Uh, and so this goal or this strategy here is intended to focus on those species as well. It's not, you know, that we may need to do additional things. We call them fine filter strategies for the individual species of concern. Good example being spotted owls. Um, the last one I mentioned is number eight, and that is to use active management to meet habitat objectives over time and across the landscape. And this doesn't mean any, everywhere. There'd be places where passive approaches, as you mentioned earlier, like high-graded old stands, uh, might be more appropriate and more cost-effective uh, as well. But as with or you know, statute and rule speaks to active management. There's a real role it can play. Uh, these are young forests. We have a lot of, we desire a lot of things out of them. In many cases, they're simple forests because of that disturbance history. And so uh, we can use active management to send them into onto desirable trajectories. Um, that's it. The other thing also is just to point out again, as Liz did earlier, to cons that an additional strategy is to consider regional and landscape context. Uh, when implementing all of the other wildlife strategies. And so it's not cookie cutter across, you know, north to south across the coast range of Oregon uh, and in the Cascades. It's thoughtful about place and ownership patterns, forest types, uh, and other considerations at that, at that scale. Oh, I still have measurable outcomes? Yeah. Well, I like my strategy so much, I forgot about <laughs> that. Uh, so as, as Mike mentioned, the measurable outcomes are very high level. Uh, the, the meat will be in the quantifiable targets. And so uh, these read maximize wildlife habitat for all native wildlife species, which is somewhat consistent with GPV language. Uh, maximize compliance with federal and state endangered species acts and minimize short and long-term impacts of climate change on wildlife habit and habitat. So obviously very lofty, uh, but as we've tried to show, the meat will be elsewhere. <clears throat> um, and with that, I can I either take questions? questions. Yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead.
couple of questions on habitat. One simple one, um, can you give us some idea uh, how many habitat types you kind of recognize or that you work with to see whether you have them or not? And then the other thing is, do you look at how one type of habitat might be most appropriate located next door to another habitat because there's something about the species that play back and forth between those habitats. And then how extensive is your look at the organisms that live in the forest? Do you look at the soil biota? Do you look at um, the animals that mostly spend their time up off the ground aerially versus those that live on and in the ground? and some are subnivian, they, they live under the snow particularly, those kinds of things. Do you look at all those and, and organisms that primarily live in the water? I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea how broad your look is at that. Yeah, yeah, great questions, all of them. I think I already forgot the middle one, but. <laughs> uh, I, well, as far as what species we look at, we're generally only looking at, um, we're, we're only conducting formal surveys for spotted owls and marble murrelets as far as wildlife species go. We do a lot of aquatic sampling and monitoring as well, fish sa like sampling for upper extent of fish, et cetera. Um, but no, I mean, most of what we do on the ground as far as survey work is driven by this compliance with Federal Endangered Species Act um, and is very closely tied to the sale program itself. So we don't have like very extensive data set, you know, inventory data for wildlife on our lands uh, would be the short answer there. As far as the habitat types go, um, it's all of them. <laughs> no, so that, I mean, so we want to acknowledge the range of variation in forest types, which come from either an east-west or a north-south or, you know, various environmental gradients that produce different forest types across our landscape. And so on any given district, it would be taking into account that variation that exists and managing for that, as well as for the range in ages associated with that. Um, so it's not just you have these different types, but different ages represented for any given type. Uh, and those, of course, are just forest types, which aren't necessarily habitat. They provide habitat. And so thinking about unique habitats, rock, like rocky, out, out, you know, rock features that provide hibernacula for bats are a pretty classic example, um, or large uh, live trees with with uh, cavities or dead trees, you know, but large legacy trees are another really critical feature out there on the landscape. So yet yeah, we are, the plan intends to take into account all of those things and manage for them, yes. There was a question in the middle that I forgot. Maybe you did too. <laughs> I'm gonna say it, it sounds a little sparse, I'm concerned that you're setting the statement sets you up to fail. Uh, I don't think it's possible to maximize wildlife habitat for all native wildlife species because whatever you do is going to minimize habitat for somebody and maximize it for somebody else. And I think you ought to, I think you need some qualifying language in there uh, because that's that's just a you, you can't do it. Yeah, I mean, so it is, it's within the context of all the other things we're trying to achieve, right? And so it's not actually maximize, it's uh, maximize sort of to the maximum extent practical in any given spot, right? Uh, that's not as exciting a policy line, but, but no, I, that, that criticism is really valid and it's something we're still kind of working through on these, on that. And also we've heard criticism about what is maximizing compliance. What does that look like? Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, you know, it really does go back to that optimization uh, process. And if we were to take two really, you know, just two things that most people would assume are diametrically opposed in a lot of ways, right? But say, say timber harvest and wildlife habitat, you know, or, 
or whatever, well, late seral habitat or something like that. Um, you know, as you go down the axes, there's basically a line where you're maximizing one, and you have none of the other, and you're to or you're totally maximizing the other, and you, ha you know, and somewhere out there, anywhere along there, there is an optimization solution, and that's really what we're what we're focusing focusing on. But when we put the measurable objectives out there, we really didn't want to predispose. We didn't want to be predecisional on anybody about what they thought they could ask for, and so. It's a little weird. I mean, but in, in the context of our current plan, even, I'd say that we're achieving a lot of these same things within that context of the balance we're trying to find. So are we maximizing, you know, are, are you maximizing wildlife habitat considering that you're also trying to maximize, you know, wood fiber production, for instance, and, uh, and then add in other things such as protection of aquatic and riparian areas and all that sort of stuff. But this is where we list them singly and try and get the, and try and address what people are individually concerned about. Yeah, and these, when these went live, we were, I was kind of wondering how they'd be received and like, they need to change. And that's, that's why we're here, frankly. So uh, again, thanks. Okay. So I'm going to go over uh, some of the timber goals. Uh, again, this is a, um, just a, a highlight or a sampling of each one of, of a few of the goal strategies and measurable outcomes for uh, the production and harvest of timber and special forest products, all of which uh, begin on page 101 in that draft plan. And by coincidence, there are seven uh, of each of, of goal strategies and measurable outcomes for the, this um, topic. So uh, the first goal, goal actually goal one, is to provide sustainable and predictable production of forest products that generate revenues for the benefit of the state, counties, and local taxing districts. And that is just directly taken from um, OAR 6290320, which deals with our greatest permanent value rule. Uh, goal two is to contribute timber revenue towards financial viability of the state forest division. And that, that was one of our charges why we started down this uh, road to revise our for current forest management plan to ensure financial viability of the state forest division. And goal seven is to ensure road systems uh, facilitates achievement of timber harvest objectives. Uh, and that's stating we will ensure that our road systems can support our harvest objectives, uh, uh, but also uh, support um, uh, f properly functioning aquatic systems too. <clears throat> so um, strategies that we are implementing are, although they, they again, they seem very timber centric uh, in this section, do speak to other resource goals and, and do speak more specifically to forest health and rehabilitation and more integrated harvest objectives. So strategy one, is to act actively manage uh, state forest landscape and individual forest stands. And this would account, account for all aspects of forest management, volume, financial return, rehabilitation of, of stands, and other resource objectives. <clears throat> Strate strategy two is to apply standards for civil cultural techniques and conservation strategies. Examples of this would be the amount of green trees or, or down woody debris left within a regeneration harvest unit. Uh, st strategy three, to actively manage the state forest landscape to incorporate silvicultural treatments that integrate harvest objectives with habitat and other conservation objectives at a landscape level. So again, complementary harvest planning, uh, making sure that um, the strategies we're implementing are taken into account the broader picture of the overall landscape. So the measurable outcomes will be used to inform our management strategies on where adjustments need to be made to better meet goals uh, of the plan and an adaptive management concept like uh, Nick alluded to and, and uh, Mike uh, also talked about. Um, so they are, again, somewhat higher level. Um, so measurable outcome number four is to maximize volume of merchantable wood fiber available for harvest. 
Uh, maybe an example of this would be the acres of uh, a measurement would be the acres of rehabilitation of understocked or unhealthy stands. Um, measurable outcome number five is to maximize the availability of timber for future harvests. Um, this may be measured. Uh, an example might be something like um, monitoring our, su our success in reforestation. You know, 90% of our acres are fully stocked. Um, Measurable outcome seven, maximize net revenue per acre available for harvest. Um, that might be measured uh, through, through uh, the utilization or implementation of, of new harvest practice, practices previously, un, uh, you know, areas where we, they were deemed previously unharvestable uh, that we now be with um, new techniques or different uh, equipment types might be able to be harvested. So that might be uh, just an example of some measurement that we could use. So um, so that's what I had for the timber section. Is there any questions on that? Again, it's the same thing like um, Tom had just mentioned with the wildlife section when maximizing wildlife habitat and then one of the timber goals is to maximize, uh, you know, production of wood fiber. So those do seem like competing interests and that's where you go into this structured decision making where we're trying to work with stakeholders to find the optimum answer. So. Chris? It's kind of on the species. You know, what, do, you, do you have a hierarchy of which species of tree or timber you're most interested in? Um, you know, taking the broadest example, is there any emphasis on hardwoods, some, some reason to have hardwoods versus softwoods and, and that sort of thing. How do you figure all that into the equation? A lot of those decisions are made at the, at the, you know, at the district level by our reforestation team. And when, what we're looking to do is always try to put back the native species that are growing, that have grown there successfully in the past. So not trying to force a dug fir into a wetter site. You know, we'd be looking at putting uh, alder or um, spruce or hemlock. So that's, that's, you know, we, we try to let the, the ground dictate the species composition. Um, and that's, again, we're, you know, when we're planning out several years in advance, because we have to sow our seed several years in advance to have it available. So that those, those looks do take place, you know, several years ahead of the actual harvest. So. And, and we do have a fair amount of hardwood, particularly on our Tillamook district, and certainly see the value of it. it actually, from a market standpoint, it can be really um, valuable at times, depending on market conditions. Serves an important role ecologically on the forest in terms of diversity, um, for sure. And it grows well there. <laughs> so, you know, it's really important. We're, all that has to be accounted for as we look at the landscape. So thank you. What do you consider the hardwood? Typically, for in the Northwest region, we're talking about maples and alders. Yeah. In terms of, of uh, I'm, sort of I'm, the. I'm a woodworker, and, and I'm sorry, but alder is not a hardwood. Oh, it's not. I, but I'm sure. I'm just curious how we. It's okay. What would you get, tell me? What you would yeah. think needs so, to be considered? So what uh, hardwoods would you want to see out there? I, I don't know. I'm just curious when you said hardwood, I'm trying to maple, of course, but one of the most underutilized as a woodworker, one of the most underutilized hardwood trees in western maple. Yeah. I, I, it's so sad to see it go to water and they grind it up for pulp and put it in paper. Oh, man. Yeah. What a loss. But, and ecologically, um, maples are really important uh, as well for all types of different species. So. Um, they can take up a big footprint, you know, they're very limmy, um, but they're definitely a, a part of our approach for, um, you know, wildlife habitat. There's a hardwood mill in uh, Garibaldi that purchases a lot of our alder, so they call themselves a hardwood mill. <laughs> What's that? 
Is what hard? Open? No. I don't think it's no, still it's still open. open. They're purchasing from our uh, Northwest Harvest. Sales. Um, they were just at our last meeting. Anyway, that's why we call hardwood. But I hear you. I have alder floors, what that's worth. Alder, too, important uh, source of nutrients and riparian systems as well. So. And head walls. Yeah. Oh, yes. So do you guys uh, plant alder, or do you just kind of, you, you know, it, it grows mainly in the areas? Do you guys try to plant, like? We up do. in Washington, um, I've been part of groups that we planted all there, and it just doesn't work out. We just we we do plant some. We haven't planted uh, most recently. We haven't. Uh, it's been a few years, but a lot of times we we uh, plant alder in areas where we have uh, root rot pockets to fix the soils. Um, we uh, we probably it's more forgiving here because we don't have as many freeze issues. I know Forest Grove had a, a plantation that was about oh, almost 20 years old. You know, it had, I think it had been uh, pruned and thinned. Some of some of it, anyway. They had a, I think it was two or three years ago. We had that big ice storm, and the whole plantation um, was damaged. So there are risks with planting alder, uh, and as you well know, a lot of it comes back on its own. It seems to do better when it's intermixed amongst other species and not a, just a solid um, stand alder. So, but we are, you know, again. Uh, using it, it's a tool in the toolbox to use in certain areas um, where we have problems with uh, root rot or if it is a wetter area where we, that might be one of the only species that will grow back. So thanks for your question. There's a hardwood research co-op and I'm uh, struggling to, Nick and I were just having a side conversation to know if it's still active or not, but we, we were part of that historically. Um, you know, we have membership on that, so we're definitely tracking but yeah there's it's challenging to plant and then to maintain and, that, and isn't, isn't yeah that's exactly right and that's why it shows up after disturbance because it can grow in disturbed soils that may be more nutrient poor and then it also does well in riparian areas because it doesn't mind having its feet wet. So it shows up in those areas. It's really good to have in, in sort of the headwaters or head walls um, of riparian that drain into the watershed um, because other species don't grow well there um, and it fixes nitrogen that then becomes a source uh, for uh, water nutrients downstream. So there's definitely a lot of really good things. <coughs> about red alder for, from an ecosystem perspective. Which is actually a good segue to the aquatic goals. So this starts on page 105. Um, and, and just as uh, Nick and Ty did, I'm just going to highlight a couple of these in the interest of time. Um, but again, it helps lay out. There's a little introductory section around um, the functions of uh, riparian and aquatic areas. And then it gets into goals, strategies, and measurable outcomes. And what we've done in this section, you'll see it's titled Aquatics, Landslides, and Roads. We've pulled all that in together because of how intricately those um, factors are um, linked. So um, how we uh, manage around landslide prone areas is going to influence aquatic ecosystems. Drainage patterns are going to influence landslide potential. Roads obviously have the, you know, where they cross stream channels um, and change potentially hydrologic patterns are uh, really important for us to pay attention to to maintain aquatic function. So on page 105, I'll just highlight two of those goals. Goal number two is to establish a network of mature riparian buffers around streams and other water bodies to support watershed functions that protect water quality and promote high quality aquatic and riparian habitat. So this is um, getting down to more of the site scale. There are goals that are at the larger scale, but that's really what that's you know, speaking to with that network of mature riparian buffers. And then uh, goal number three reads that we will minimize the effects of roads and landslides on watershed processes and aquatic habitat. 
So also uh, starting on um, page 105 and going through uh, to 107, because we're covering all of these elements, our set of strategies. So um, the first one I'll highlight is under the riparian and aquatic strategies on page 105 is the first strategy, which is to establish uh, riparian buffer standards appropriate to maintain, protect, and enhance ecological functions of aquatic um, features. And there are several sub-strategies in there that have us classifying streams based on um, sort of their um, the ecosystem services that they provide, um, establishing no harvest buffers, um, equipment exclusion zone, zones, retaining trees um, around seasonal streams, et cetera. So that's an introduction into that first strategy. And then um, moving to page 106, which is under landslides, debris flows, and steep slopes. The second strategy reads to establish no harvest riparian buffers on debris flow prone streams below upland unstable slopes. So what we know about um, these areas on the landscape is that regardless of management, they are prone to landslides and debris flows. When we manage in those areas, we want to make sure that we've maintained as much of the ecological function as possible by establishing no harvest buffers around there. We're stepping back from those areas. And also, when or if they do fail, they'll be delivering wood to their downstream reaches of the stream. This has been demonstrated through research to be a really important watershed function, and that's that when a landslide does occur, it brings wood and gravels to the stream system that are important for aquatic habitat. So that's the basis of that strategy. And then finally, um, I was going to highlight um, under road strategies, I'm highlighting the third strategy, which is on page 107. And it reads to avoid roads in critical locations, including parallel to riparian areas with potential for slope instability or the potential to impacts water quality. Um, and then there's some sub strategies in there of some um, internal policies we have that define critical locations um, and the importance of construction um, best practices and vacating, relocating roads, et cetera, um, to address those concerns. And then for measurable outcomes, those are on page 107. And I'm just highlighting, you can see there's 13 there, and I would argue that's because we're covering a lot with riparian aquatic areas, landslides and roads, so there is a lot there. You'll see it's the same language around maximize and minimize. We're hearing that that's maybe falling short for folks, so we're thinking hard about what we might do there. Um, but the first one is to minimize short and long-term impacts of climate change on aquatic resources and water quality. And the second one is, to, or excuse me, the seventh one to highlight here is maximizing functions and values of, of wetland habitats. And the ninth one is to minimize road connectivity to streams at crossing and adjacent to streams. Um, and there's... Uh, all kinds of ways there's I Ty did a good job of sort of giving some examples of how this stuff can be measured I think that the first one I highlight there around climate change is really challenging I think we're still learning how to measure it but there are some tools and, and neat research being done um, on potential effects of climate change on stream temperature where we have a good handle on how to measure wetland function as well as uh, road connectivity and effects on water quality that type of research is really solid and we know how to draw on that so those were the three. Obviously, as I said, there's several other resources that are covered in Chapter 3, but we wanted to highlight those three just by way of example. Those also tend to be the three um, categories that people are really uh, interested in. The forest health one's really important. We didn't highlight that. That starts to speak clearly to um, both carbon sequestration as well as um, well, the effects of climate change uh, in particular. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure this is the appropriate place to ask this question. And that is, 
herbicide use. Okay. And definitely go on the herbicide in streams. We're 80, 85, Casa County is 80, 85 percent. Everything you do in the forest here ends up in the Columbia River. And we're at a point now where uh, how many salmon species do you have? 12 or 13. 12 or 13. I mean, the salmon that we levels just keep going down the size of the salmon. And there's a lot of reasons, one of which is poisons in our water. And so uh, I, I'm just curious, why do we have to continue to use herbicide? You want to put people to work, you can't hand release new plants. Mm -hmm. And boy, would that put people to work. It's a, it's a dirty, cheap job, but I bet you can find people who would do it. And uh, so I would like to point out, I'd really like to see less use of herbicides on our forest. And I understand now is the buffer zone on a, we used to call it class one streams at the fish barrier chain. I don't know if you guys changed the classification. I think is about 100 feet. Well, that's like about from here to that building over there, you know. Would you sit here while a helicopter's spewing poison? You can move, but a salmon can't. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see some real problems with the buffer zone. I understand Washington's forest practice much larger buffer zones than Oregon does. I don't know why, but uh, I just see this herbicide use just continually on and on. And it is long term. There have been plenty of studies to show how far that stuff drifts, how long it's in the environment, and what it's doing. You know, Roundup now has, I see on TV, a class action suit, uh, <laughs> some kind of non hodgkin lymphoma. And they're getting sued for class action. And I'm pretty sure it's the ground that you guys are using in the forest. Uh, so I have not even that chemical name. But, yeah. uh, anyway, I'm very, very concerned about herbicide use in our forest. And I think we can hand release plants and we put people to work. Right. So. Appreciate that. And uh, that's consistent message we're hearing from stakeholders. Um, and there's a survey done every couple years, I uh, can't think of the company that does it, of Oregonians' beliefs and values. Who is it? DHM. DHM, thank you, um, around forestry. And some of the consistent messages are looking for a balanced approach to forestry, reforestation, important water quality, it's wildlife habitat. And pretty consistently now um, stating a, that folks don't want to see herbicide applications in forests. So that is definitely showing up in um, all kinds of places where you know we're polling the public. Um, so I understand that it's it is a um, effective tool to get quick, uh, effective uh, reforestation. Effective in terms of um, successful reforestation without having to go back in and, and replant several times. Uh, so we know that um, it's ten. It is about half the expense of doing other types of release. So that's a, a factor as well. There are areas on the landscape, particularly in the Tillamook Forest, where it's extremely unsafe to put people on those slopes doing that. So that's safety is, is a concern. <coughs> All that said, um, we're hearing that loud and clear, and it's consistent. And we've been talking internally around what are some things that we could put on the table that provides um, some options uh, that, that still allow us to use that as a tool in some areas and maybe take a different approach in others. But we're just now starting those conversations. But this is a consistent message and, and we're well aware that we need to, you know, there's an opportunity to think about this a little differently. But I, it is, it is an um, efficient, effective tool for us right now. And, uh, and uh, again, on this aquatic space, I, uh, I don't see this uh, I don't see the word salmon, you know, which is man, mm -hmm. what the about. I actually do think it's in here. Um, right, and so we're seeing uh, all, um, all aquatic organisms. So we could call out more clearly, um, you know, the iconic 
salmon and steelhead species. That would be easy to do. There's the species of concern line. That's the same. It's, so where is that? The salmonids are called out specifically in the greatest permanent value rule, which of course is in the hierarchy. We take the direction of the forest management plan from the greatest permanent value rule. So we, uh, it, it's not an omission. The uh, salmonids are definitely included. Salmon are included. And um, thank you for that, Justin. And um, if you turn, is this what I'm talking about? So let me find the right page here for you. Appendix B, page 150, starts on page 157. And it's a list of what's characterized as species of concern. That's a um, threatened and endangered um, specific terminology. And sorry, those trucks are loud. Um, as you can, what we've done there, we, is air quotes, because it's um, Nick and our aquatic specialists, have listed all the species that are considered as species of concern. And that includes whether they're considered as threatened or endangered. endangered. And so you can see it's quite a long list of aquatic species, um, including fish, as well as terrestrial species. Do you want to speak more to that? All right, well, I just could have specified that when we have those lines, those strategy lines that say protect, maintain, and enhance habitat for species of concern, we're talking specifically about those listed in this appendix. And so the fish species start on page 164. And so, you know, Chinook of the various runs of so it, we even break it down to whether it's a spring run or fall run um, in cutthroat um, coho lamprey so there's it's a pretty comprehensive list but we can call that out more clearly in that front section so i appreciate that however on page 100 in chapter three number three it says you will use integrated pest management to suppress or prevent unacceptable pest damage. Are you doing that currently now? Um, well, we are. I don't have our civil culturalist here. I don't know if there's someone here that can speak to that, if you can, Ty, but it's integrated pest management. Um, yeah, we had an instance uh, somewhat recently where we had an outbreak of pocket gophers in one of our uh, plantations, and we came up with an integrated pest management plan to treat those. And uh, I don't know if, you, pardon, using what? Using uh, a granular um, pellet. Talking about integrated pest management. Tra boomer trapping. Well, and we also trap. Um, uh, mountain beavers that also eat the roots of the trees. So that's that's really probably our biggest uh, integrated pest management uh, thing that we do. Um, they go in and eat the roots of the trees out and kill the trees in the plantation. So there's a variety of things that we do based on you know the cause and what they're affecting. But we have you know, tree protection programs, you know, and we have browse effects. So we tube and, you know, cap, bud cap trees, for instance. We, you know, prep a area prior to planting to just minimize, you know, not eliminate, but minimize populations of, um, you know, things that are going to, you know, harmfully impact the trees, you know, to an unacceptable level. Um, this is primarily trapping with um, mountain beavers. We have actually contractors and also inmates that go out and trap prior to planting. Um, there's small scale things that happen to other pests, but they're very, you know, site specific and you know, occur at different times. So it's not a landscape level piece. Yes, right. And we have staff, not part of the state forest division, they serve the whole agency, but we have entomologists that we use and pathologists that look at a variety of, you know, tree and plant pathogens as well as other pests, forest pests that occur that are, um, you know, just, um, in response to events, you know, pine, you know, mountain, you know, bark beetles or those types of things that occur. So there's a variety of things that occur, but, you know, for tree protection is the biggest thing we, we do, a variety of methods to get our trees reestablished that helps. To be the one to uh, be on the other side of the fence on, on the salmon, um, 
I think far too much attention is paid to single species and calling them out as being so darn important that we've got to save them. Salmon can't exist alone in these streams any more than we can exist alone on the planet without other organisms. Mm -hmm. I think the stress of the document should be on a healthy uh, aquatic environment that support fish because the fish will come if there are macroinvertebrates and other organisms in the streams. So those little inconsequential, in air quotes, organisms are what really count in the streams. And the fish will come along if the streams are healthy. So I, I wouldn't call out salmon and make it like that's the emphasis. I would call out having healthy streams that have a diverse biota in them that support these Thank uh, you. species that we exploit. The, the other thing is on, on the landslides, I, I noticed in what you showed, and I haven't read through the whole section yet, you stressed um, the land at the toe of the slides and trying to protect that to keep debris flows from coming down. And actually, um, it's important not to disturb the, the toe of a slide, but to keep these flows from being more common, you need to protect the, the head wall up above the slide. Above the slide is going to determine whether the thing moves or not. So I would something in about you know, mapping out slide terrains and understanding where head walls exist and protecting those. Perfect. We can do that. Totally agree. Yeah, I have a comment and a question, I guess. Uh, you know, a few years back, I think it was 2015, <clears throat> Oregon lost uh, $1.2 million worth of federal grant money for failure to clean, uh, clean up uh, debris and the silt from coastal streams that was primarily caused by logging. And I was just wondering, I'm assuming that most of these goals and uh, uh, were in place at that time. I'm just wondering what uh, what may have happened and also uh, what uh, further assurances do we have now that something like this isn't going to happen again? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I know what you're referencing there, and that was really linked with what's called the Forest Practices Act which um, all forest managers have, to, it's the law of the land for anyone, that, any landowner. We are managing public land as, so it's our, we're a landowner. <clears throat> and, but the um, forest management plan currently and this one go above and beyond what's required under the Forest Practices Act. So we're doing more than what's in that document, in that set of laws. Um, and that um, decision to take that money away from the state was based on what was in the Forest Practices Act. Uh, is, is the Department of Forestry responsible for uh, monitoring or kind of keeping track of what's happening on private land uh, by private, uh, you know, industrial uh, yep. logging organizations? I mean, do you, are you supposed to kind of make sure they're not doing the wrong thing too? And, Yep. Is that part of your journey? That, that's exactly right. In fact, we have a stewardship forester here today. She works closely, and we have those in every district. Our stewardship foresters work closely with landowners to help them understand what the laws require uh, and to um, determine if they're compliant with the laws and if not, take the appropriate action. So, that, so that's one piece around implementation. And then the private forest division, it's a separate division from state forests. It's in, obviously, within the ODF organization. Uh, the private forest division has a monitoring um, team. Um, and so they are constantly taking on one project or another. They can only do so much, but right, they just completed and changed the riparian rules for um, the western portions of Western Oregon because they did a big research project that showed changes needed to happen. And now they're looking um, at the rules, stream protection rules for the Siskiyou georegion. Um, so those are two big things they're doing. They're also looking at establishing resource sites. This is how the Forest Practices Act, um, language that the Forest Practices Act uses. They use the term resource site. Um, and so they've been asked to look at establishing resource sites for marble murelets 
as well as for COHO. And with that in the Forest Practices Act, then the protection rules would flow from that. Yeah, this, this may have more to do with the Forest Practices Act, but one of the things that I'll just throw it out and I'd be glad to hear your comments about it. One of the things that's really disturbed me about the way we protect uh, streams is that usually uh, the streams are called out as fish bearing to be protected. And what concerns me is like all of the tiny tributary streams that get aerially sprayed over and run over by heavy equipment and so forth, that uh, the water from which can be down into a fish bearing stream in a matter of hours. But we don't seem to pay that much attention to them. You know, they're heating up, they're warming up the fish bearing streams. So on um, state forests, we actually have no cut buffers around our small non-fish bearing streams. So our protection standards go a little bit, are, are more restrictive and go higher up into the watershed. They drop, but to be clear, there are um, streams that flow only seasonally. So sometimes they have water, sometimes they don't. And in those cases, we're leaving sort of um, non-merchantable trees is what we call them. They base, you know, um, they provide ecological function, but they're not suitable for marketing. So we leave those there, um, and we have we keep the equipment out, et cetera. Having that on the landscape just by definition kind of pushes that herbicide applications farther away. But that's that's how that's handled right now. Okay. Yes. In the aquatic goals, um, and I know you didn't pull all of them, you just pulled examples for us, but I'm not, I'm not seeing this term species of concern listed in there. Species of concern was referred to in the wildlife goals, and I, I would like to see something about species of concern in there, which obviously would include the salmon and then the other aquatic species that he referred to um, more broadly. I do think it's, a, it's amazing that the, the word salmon doesn't show up in here and are not addressed in goals. Um, and as we've already said, everything that happens in the forest goes into the Columbia River. Um, currently 12 or 13 species of salmon uh, threatened or endangered in the Columbia River. And under aquatic strategies, um, harvesting is addressed, roads is addressed, but again, I'm not seeing the word herbicides in there. I'm sort of feeling like herbicides is invisible in here and salmon are invisible in here. Okay, so we talked to Troop. We haven't uh, called out herbicides, and so that's definitely important feedback. Um, in terms of the species of concern, that's on page 106. It's strategy number two, number two, protect, maintain, and enhance habitat for species of concern. And then underneath it, align the strategies for um, applicable species um, as published by ODFW and as well as the federal agencies. And then establishing aquatic anchors in consultation with ODFW and where habitat goals are compatible with terrestrial anchors, which is um, another strategy for the terrestrial species. So that's where that's called out. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the next piece I want to talk about is moving now from the specific resources and thinking more about implementation. And so there's a handout, it's got this colorful table on it, um, and it's called Implementation Priorities. And it is in the forest, in this draft document in front of you. Let me find the page. So it's on page 123, but we basically lifted that out and made this handout because the colors, we're going to have to fix this for black and white, um, the colors don't demonstrate the concept that well, so we wanted to give you a color handout. So this goes back to the funding conversation that we are having earlier. and. Um, the current forest management plan that we're considering to revise um, contemplates how financial conditions are going to impact our ability to implement the plan. And it says very, it states that there's going to be trade-offs that have to be made and at any given time we may be doing full implementation of the plan. At another time we may not be able to, but over time we should be able to 
um, meet those objectives and, and mostly do that full implementation. But it only, it's a very coarse characterization of that. And so it's, it establishes three different levels. So what we did, what we're doing with this is being a little bit more, um, we're expanding the thinking on this. There's still more work to do here. And we've set up some more specific criteria that help us understand, that can help us really decide what implementation level we're in, where we want to be, and how we explain that to the public. Um, I would argue that over really since uh, the late 2000s, we have not been able to fully implement the plan. So we've been, out of those three levels, we've been in that middle zone really, and in the current plan that's characterized as focusing on revenue generating activities and high priority monitoring projects. That's one of the reasons we thought we should revise the plan is so that we've got something that we can fully implement. But again, the plan, current plan doesn't really help us um, really target where we are and be able to explain that to folks. So we're putting together, we've put together this matrix that uh, looks at a couple different financial criteria. So one of them is the Forest Development Fund, and that's that upper left-hand corner as you're looking at it. Forest Development Fund um, is our operating fund. So of our one-third of the revenue that we keep, it goes into the Forest Development Fund, and we use that to pay for managing the forests and providing recreation, et cetera, doing restoration work. Um, and then to the right is we also have a tool to forecast our upcoming revenue. We feel most um, confident in those forecasts in terms of just a three-year increment. So it's a fairly sh short-term look. All the economists tell us from a... Um, um, wood market perspective, if you try to forecast any longer than that, that the uncertainty increases dramatically. So we're thinking about it in that three-year time frame. And so really what we're looking at is thinking about what the Forest Development Fund balance is and what we think it would be in the next few years. And so we've characterized that in terms of um, a prudent forest development fund balance. Our calculations right now are that if we have about a year's operating budget, six months to a year in that forest development fund, that that's a prudent balance. So if it falls below that, that's less than prudent. If it's right in there, we're considering that prudent. And if it's greater than that, then we have some more opportunities. But that also relates to where we think we're going. And so that's that forecast. If it's a decreasing, so revenues are going to decrease versus if they're increasing. And so our thinking here is trying to really characterize the gray zones, um, if you will. So up in the upper left corner, we would call that level one. That's kind of the minimum level that we can implement the forest management plan. And that would be because the balance is below a six-month operating fund, um, and we're predicting continued decline in revenue. And as you move over, um, there's an increasing level, uh, even though the prudent balance is, is, even though it's less than a prudent balance. And so we can do a little, so at the lowest level, we're just in a maintenance mode. As you move to the right, we start doing a little bit more reinvestment because it's looking like a more positive outcome. If you go down a row, now we're looking at, we've, in a situation where we've got six months to a year of an operating balance, but our forecast might be that it's decreasing as we look into the future. But because we're in this prudent situation, we feel like comfortable continuing to reinvest. And by that, I mean maybe building more recreation areas, more money put into our um, education programs, um, road um, upgrades, um, more research and monitoring. Those are what I mean by reinvestments. You move to the right, we have a prudent balance, and we see an increase in the next three years. And so now we can even do more reinvestments. And then you come down to the bottom row, we've got a really good fund balance, but it might be decreasing in the future. We still feel comfortable doing what we're doing with reinvestments because the prudent balance. And out to the right where the, we've got a good fund balance and we have increasing revenue, uh, we can really actually expand our investments. So I think that, you know, what we need to work on is kind of characterizing that a, uh, a little bit more, um, with a little bit more clarity, but this is where we are at this point with the draft. As you look down at the bottom of this handout and onto the next page, 
it, we attempt to define those levels. We're calling them level uh, one, two, three, and four. Um, so you can see those coincide with the table and do a little bit more description of what it means um, to make what the management focus is and what the investments are. So this is really trying to be provide us with a tool on where we think we need to be in implementation and also be able to describe to the public and stakeholders and the board uh, why we're doing what we're doing. Yes. Okay, here you are. ODF. And there's the uh, Oregon Forest Research Institute. Why don't you take the money from them and use it for our forests? What do they do for you except for sending propaganda that our forests are really healthy, which is not right. And also, there's also the Forest and Industries Council, which is promoting all kinds of falsehoods about our forests. And I think that you should get rid of that research institute because they're not doing you a bit of good. Mm -hmm. So those are le legislatively established. Um, OK. OK. I, I'm sorry, I don't really. And the other group, OFIC, is that's an industry. Yeah. So we. Yeah. So I, we have zero control over that. But uh, appreciate your feedback, Kathleen. I know that one of the um, concerns um, the last few years are, are the wildfire costs to your department. Um, is there? How is that? Because I know the last couple of years. ODS has gone to the general fund to ask for more um, help with that. Does that, that influence this plan at all, or can you? Right, so um, that's correct. The, so as far as, let me just start with fire funding. The, per, the way that fire funding has been set up is, is anchored in the, um, the, the fire conditions that we had historically. And in those scenarios, the types of fires we had, how long they're on the landscape, the acres, et cetera, cost about $10 million a year to um, do fire suppression on. Um, and there's a system set up financially to help support that. So there's actually a um, Wildfire Protection Act that establishes a $10 million fund that we can, that the agency can draw on and, re, and refill. There's a, um, we have a, insurance held by the Lloyds of London, and then a line of credit through the treasurer's office. And all that is intended uh, to be cyclic. Um, when we protect fire on federal that's coming off of federal land or under agreements with federal uh, ownership, particularly BLM, that becomes a different story. And, um, and then, so there's that I'll talk about in a second. And then fires that threaten um, um, houses or communities or uh, those are uh, funded through FEMA. Can't think of the, what that acronym stands for. Those are, we call them FEMA fires. So when we incur costs on those types of fires, we are paying for those and then we have to be reimbursed by the federal agencies and through FEMA. And that has taken a long time and someone mentioned over five years and that's about, you know, it's at least that long. So, you, so that's a process that takes time. Then you add to that that now, because of the fire conditions that we have, we're talking more about 60, 70, 100 million dollars a year for fire suppression. And so we've got a much different environment in terms of costs and the types of fires that we're seeing on the landscape. And we have a funding structure that is antiquated and does not help or serve Oregonians well for us to be able to do that. So that's the, the, if you've been reading the newspaper, that's what that's about. The governor put together the wildfire council to look at that. You're right, we have gone to the legislature, uh, at least uh, maybe the two sessions, past two sessions, um, and asked for funding, particularly last sec session, asked for a pretty big funding package that would also bring some more people into the organization. We weren't successful with that. So that's the situation we're in. We're, uh, I think we're behind at this point in collecting money from the feds and from FEMA to the tune of about $60 million. So the governor's office has stepped in to really help us with that. And um, we're, 
helping us figure out, you know, helping to um, collect those payments, give us systems and support and bring in some extra resources to collect those payments from the federal agencies, um, as well as bringing in a team helping to fund um, an outside group, consulting group to come in and look at our processes um, for collecting these monies and help, find, you know, really tighten that up. So we are tracking that really carefully. We don't let those things linger too long. We have the right resources to do that. Has there been any discussion of completely creating a completely different uh, separate uh, 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 department for wildfires? I mean, since it's going to become a big part of our future, why not completely separate that from the Oregon Department of Forestry? It seems like it would free you guys up from a lot of right. headaches. It looks like Mike wants to I answer do. that. I, I see you. Really <laughs> <jump in. laughs> <laughs> So um, I'll answer that question first. Um, you know, we, we do have a pretty deep organizational history that way. And, and the, the, regardless of who's paying the bills at any given point, um, a lot of us, you know, Ty and I get to work together on fires too and all that kind of stuff. So we have what we call a, you know, it's kind of a militia concept where a lot of us that work in other divisions and programs of the agency end up going out on fires in certain in certain positions um, on big product uh, project fires. Um, and so, you know, divorcing it would be a fairly difficult uh, uh, thing to do. Not entirely impossible, perhaps, but, um, but uh, uh, fairly difficult. What I do want to talk about, too, though, with the implementation plan, uh, implementation levels of the FMP and the Forest Development Fund is that while the well, you know, the crisis swirling around right now around cash flow for the agency overall um, uh, isn't really affecting our strategic decisions in this grid up here. So in terms of cash on hand, not so great. But in terms of the strategic reinvestments that we're looking at making, we know how much is actually credited to the FDF side of things for our management of the Board of Forestry Lands. And we certainly continue to make our uh, future, you know, we certainly plan to plan out those strategic investments based on that and not, uh, you know, whether we're overdrawn at the moment. And there, but there has been conversations, you know, uh, the California model is called Cal Fire, and that's all they do is fire. But they're, that's kind of breaking down for them too, and so all across the you know, all across the West with the changes in uh, the severity and extent of fires, uh, there needs to be. Uh, I would argue. So maybe this isn't me speaking for the agency, but I the human, <laughs> the people that expect to have protection from fire, need to think about how they you know can support that effort and and because uh, you know I don't know how else it's really going to be funded. Yeah, it seems like the uh, municipalities and the fire departments are not connected with us to anything that counts. Right. Yeah. Right. And then uh, you know nationally Oregon's approach this complete and coordinated system where no matter what you're division you work in, you're on a fire team, um, is recognized as one of the best in the nation. So we have a good system. It's a funding um, and people problem because we have our folks have been out on fires at any given time for 14 days straight, come back, have a day or two off and go back out again. And so their ability to conduct their core business um, and have a family life um, is strained. And that's the kind of service um, that people maybe aren't aware is happening. And you also send teams to other states. Correct. Also. That's right. So we have three what's called incident management teams, and they're populated by people from all um, different divisions. And so um, a few of our, maybe she, I know Ty and Ron, Ashley, and Neil are all on fire teams. And then some uh, other folks uh, are what's called pool, I guess is the terminology, meaning those fire teams go, they set up a fire camp, they've got all these different 
um, units, and then there are other people that are brought in to, to fill in the needs there, so GIS or payments and planning, et cetera. Yeah, and in the depths of fire season, remember, we still have state forest business to do as well, and we'll lose very substantial amounts of staff, and like there'll be a couple of us in the office in Salem trying to do everything. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, it's a real strain. Sure, and that's a capacity issue. That's not that's not a model. That's not a problem with the model. It's that we're not we don't have the capacity. That's right. We're running with, in state forests with about thirty vacancies, so we're you know so that's one thing for state forests and getting our work done is a challenge. And we're working to fill those. It's just that our human resources department can only go so fast. But then that also affects when we're in what's called drawdown and and. You know, we've gone as far as we can to send people out on fires. It affects how many people are, are left to kind of get the work done. And it, I, we're not trying to whine. It's just kind of the reality. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, this is the full context. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one slide left, Justin tells me. So uh, continued public engagement. We've talked about this a little bit. We're having a meeting January 14th in Salem. We're still figuring out the structure for that meeting um, because at that point, Ideally, people have really read the plan, and we're able to, in some kind of coherent way, really capture that, hopefully, some specific feedback. And that's in Salem. Uh, we'll, we'll have that streaming as well. And when we do streaming, there's um, people can send in their comments, and, sh and our person that's running the streaming can make sure we're, that the whoever's in the room knows those questions are coming up. So there's that. There's an online survey opportunity um, that's been in place for a while, so welcome folks to go look at that. You can email directly to um, give comments, uh, just open-ended, whatever it is you have on your mind and you think we need to know. January 31st, uh, we, have, we need to sort of close off that, this particular outreach. Again, Mike uh, is exactly right, there will be more in the future because we need to take what we've learned fold it into the draft plan, and that has to be in front of our board members well enough in advance of their meeting in April so they can start chewing on it. So that's one of the reasons we're closing that on the 31st. And the actual board meeting, April 22nd and 23rd, that's a two-day meeting, so one day is normal board business. They'll be looking at stuff from private forests and uh, from our protection division, et cetera. The second day, or the, is a full day dedicated solely to this topic with the draft force management plan. Um, so that's going to be a big uh, day for sure. Um, and maybe uh, two things I'd wrap up on. We have talked to you a couple times about we're working on this plan at the same time we're working on a habitat conservation plan. Um, it's a lot to do with the small staff. We've got this uh, document to a place where we and we will receive gr uh, great feedback from folks. We'll be able to take that to the board for their review and conversation. We need to then focus to bring the HCP document to the board, and um, and we want them then at that point to be able to think about those together and decide what they want us to do. Do they want us to stop working on the HCP? or do they want us to stop working on this particular version of the forest management plan? And that's just a better use of our resources. The, um, an HCP has to have a companion forest management plan. So a lot of this work that we've done here would likely carry over into a, a companion forest management plan. The HCP deals directly with protection for threatened and endangered species. That's only part of what we do. You know, we do recreation work, we need cultural resources, there's a lot of other stuff. And so that would be contained in the forest management plan. So just want to make sure that even though this would kind of go on the side burner as it were, the work still carries over even if we pursue an HCP. Um, if the board should decide, and that's October for that decision making for the board, if at that point they say go forward with an HCP, we'll spend another year and a half working on the HCP, and if at the end of that period, and then at the end of that period we go back to the board and, and we'll say, hey, this is what the HCP looks like. 
75 years, this is what you get for conservation, this is what you get for managing for wood fiber. Are you happy with that Board of Forestry? And if they are, we've got a plan in place. It's a 75-year plan. It balances the resources and addresses this federal concern around threatened endangered species. If for some reason the board is not happy with that habitat conservation plan, we pick this process back up. And it doesn't mean this would be the plan that is adopted. It means we would pick up where we left off and reinitiate uh, the process uh, moving forward without an HCP. So it's a, kind of a lot there, but I uh, just wanted to give you that full picture. And then the second thing I want to say is just really appreciate everyone being here and the really, like the dialogue's been really helpful. The questions and input is really helpful. It's been a long haul. I know everyone has lots to do in your lives. So thank you so much. Um, feel free to send comments, written comments. Call, um, call Justin and then he, <laughs> or email Justin, and he can forward your question to the appropriate person that needs to answer those. Uh, Ty is, is a local contact for you always right here at the Astoria office. Um, we really value this engagement want to keep it going. And I want to thank you for coming. I know it's, uh, this is just travel and expense and I Thank appreciate you. That. I appreciate everybody coming today. And again, please help us up the material and share it with your neighbors. And you can go on their website and all of these materials are also on the website. So if you want to easier for you to do it online, they are there. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks. All right. Happy holidays, everybody.